working. Oh. Can all the uh, members of committee please take their seats? We're going to get going in about one minute. Good morning, everyone. We barely have quorum. One. This is a public meeting to consider the proposed comprehensive official plan and zoning bylaw amendments listed as items two through seven on today's agenda. For the items just mentioned, only those who make oral submissions today or written submissions before the amendments are adopted may appeal the matter to the local planning appeal tribunal. In addition, the applicant may appeal the matter to the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal if Council does not adopt an amendment within 90 days of receipt of the application for zoning and 120 days for an official plan amendment. A comment sheet is available just outside the doors for anyone wishing to submit written comments on these amendments. Uh, and if uh, any of the members that are here today have any motions that they intend to put forward, please do let uh, us know as soon as you can so that we're able to um, share that with the uh, public and with the applicant and with our, amongst ourselves. So I'd like to start off the day, I was going to start off the day with an intro to the year ahead. Um, <laughs> if I was to read you all of this, you would see how incredibly busy we are going to be over the year. It's not unusual, unusual for planning uh, committee. We know that we are... Well, the mayor calls us the workhorse of the city. Uh, we definitely have um, the most meetings and, uh, and just on policy, economic development, zoning. Uh, we have so many uh, works ongoing this year. Uh, but instead of reading it, because we have an extremely exciting thing happening today, which is the unveiling of Ottawa's new main library and that's at uh, 1230 and I know that I personally want to uh, attend uh, that uh, to, to, to see uh, it's exciting and so it'd be nice to do that and then followed up by that we'll come back here for um, the uh, Transit Commission which is going to meet in this room 
anybody that's uh, coming back for that. So I want to get right down to business and I'm going to ask that um, Councillor Gower move a motion that puts these speaking notes into the minutes. Before you do, you have no quorum at the table. Oh, now we have no quorum at the table, so could everybody please, okay, everybody not including Matt, you can stand over there because you don't count for quorum, but you'd be kind of lonely. Does he have to sit? No. Okay. No, just just that. Oh, okay. So you just agree to that? Sure, I'll move that. Okay, thank you. So we're putting these um, uh, well-written speaking notes by Mr. Cross into the minutes. All right. I have no uh, regrets uh, today, although um, I think uh, probably Councillor Brockington, who's a member of the Library Board, is probably uh, coming late. I know that Councillor Tierney, who's the chair of the Ottawa Public Library, um, he, uh, he will be here but may have to leave uh, if we don't get to where we need to be. Any declarations of interest? And confirmation of minutes from the um, Minutes 2, Planning Committee and Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee. That was our joint meeting on December the 9th. Carried? And uh, the minutes 18, Planning Committee, December the 12th. It seems like so long ago. Carried. Carried. Communications, um, a review of the current definition of warehouse zone. We got a response to that, uh, Councillor Gower uh, in inquiry. Uh, we are providing simultaneous translation uh, for this meeting, if anyone's interested in that. And so we'll start with the uh, items on the re report. Item number one is a designation of the Standard Bread Company Bakery at 951 Gladstone Avenue. Um, we have no speakers. Carried. 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 Thank you. That's an easy one and a good one. Very good. It's a very good. Thanks for saying that because, uh, wow, if you're as old as I am, you actually, and, and there's people actually older than me here, um, but I can remember like that when they were pulling it around in wagons with horses, right? And Clark's Dairy was right behind them. It just was a big part of Ottawa's history. So that's an important save. So congratulations to Court and Dana and Leslie and all your heritage folks on that. The second item is 1426 Scott Street. It's a zoning bylaw amendment in Councillor Leaper's Kitchissippi Ward. We have two speakers, so we will hold that. The next item is 3809 Barroso Cane Road, and uh, we now have a speaker. Uh, we now have somebody wanting to speak. Uh, we were going to hold it anyways because Mr. Willis has uh, asked to uh, uh, clarify um, uh, several uh, things about the application. So that's held. Uh, item number four is 4800 and 4836 Bank Street, uh, south of Finley Creek, I guess. Um, we do have uh, Nico Church and Brian Casagrande are here to speak. Um, does anyone have any questions on this one? Where are you, Brian? It's harder to... Oh, there you are. Um, do you need to speak if we uh, are prepared to carry this item? Thank you. Okay, so are we prepared to carry it? Carried? Thank, thank you. Item number five is 116 York Street. We now have some people that uh, are speaking uh, in opposition and in support, so we'll be holding that item. And number six and seven, we're going to take those together. Uh, they, are, uh, uh, they are addresses on Robinson Avenue, and um, so that both of those items will be held. And then the final item is the implementation of interest rate on development charge deferrals required pursuant to Bill 108. Um, we do have staff here if anybody has questions. Anyone have questions? If not, is the item carried? Carried. carried? Thank you. Thank you, Garrett, for wherever you are. Okay. So let's go right back to item number two, 1426 Scott Street, and I will ask Linda Hode to come forward followed by Cheryl Perrault. Oh, hi, Riley. Hey.
you want the computer? Here. Here, you take this. Hey, Linda. Thank you very much. Oh, Cheryl, you're up here too? Yep. Yes, we have a coordinated presentation with a PowerPoint. Is it on the screen? PowerPoint? PowerPoint. My very yeah, first. I hope you're okay, going I'm to enjoy it. Okay, I'm going to have to turn around then. All right. All right. Go Good. ahead whenever you're ready. So, the Hinterberg Community Association requests that you refuse this application for a temporary rezoning for a parking lot at 1426 Scott Street. To give you some context, this is the location um, shown by the star, and I forgot to bring my pen. The Tunney's Pasture Transitway Station is just to the left um, at the end of the narrow purple section. Bayview Station is to the right, where the two purple sections, uh, which I gather are mixed use centers, are intersect. So it's about four to five hundred meters um, to a, a light rail station. The context since the previous uh, request for a rezoning for a temporary parking lot has changed considerably. As you can see to the right of the slide, there is a um, former school that has been converted to condos and there is an 18-story residential apartment building being constructed. It's considerably more complete than it shows in that picture, which is uh, 2019. So the, uh, the, these developments are strengthening the residential character of the street, which as you proceed south is entirely low-rise residential. The, um, the, rest, the, the other context issue that, that has arisen is the rezoning in 2014 as a result of the Scott Street Community Design Plan. At no cost to the applicant, this site was rezoned from GM to traditional Main Street, which permits a very wide range of uses and um, has a 14.5 meter height limit. So the options have increased since the previous time. Oh, I think, did I miss? Ah, yes, I did miss one. Um, this is the uh, site plan that's proposed for this um, particular parking lot. And the landscaping, um, as you can see to the left, um, is actually on the city's property. The um, dotted line indicates the property line. So um, the applicant, uh, again, he, he will be required to provide this landscaping, but um, not on his property and uh, not at the expense of any of the parking spaces that are presently available. I'd like to address a comment um, that was in the report from the city planner in response to some, uh, some, cons some of the uh, consultation issues. He says, the owner is aware of the city and community's objective for transit, housing, and community supportive uses within this area of the city. The owner is also cognizant of the demand for parking, especially within proximity to a major employment district and the transit way. I have to disagree with this comment. It's certainly not the role of the city of Ottawa to satisfy a demand for parking, especially within proximity to a major employment district and two, two light rail stations. Indeed, the official plan and transportation master plan discouraged the provision of parking in these locations. What there is for in this neighborhood is a demand for housing. Here's a parcel of vacant and underutilized land zoned for residential use. We are inundated with requests for rezonings of smaller sites um, in order to tear down what's affordable housing in most instances, in order to replace it with more units, which is apparently going to provide housing for the missing middle. This is an ideal location, and the owner should be encouraged to provide missing middle housing, not parking. And I will give it over to, to Cheryl, who is going to give you the bit, bit of the history of this site. So we ask that you deny this application for the continuation of a parking lot at this location. It's been temporary for over 12 years. Nine of those years certainly had no approvals, and for three years there was a temporary zoning, but that lapsed five years ago, and from my understanding it's five years ago today. 
So it's, it's had no um, legal um, ability to have parking, but it's still going on. So some history of the site. In 2002, it was a gas bar, and they sought to turn it into a used car lot. And they did go through the process. We did not oppose it, but we asked for a 1.5 meter buffer on both Sterling, the residential street, and on Scott Street. That never materialized. In 2004, there was a site plan for a two-story daycare facility. Again, we asked some questions and for some buffering, but that never materialized either. In 2008, a temporary parking lot was approved by the city but the owner appealed to the OMB to make it a permanent zoning, and the OMB said no, it should be just a three-year temporary parking lot, and that the owner should uh, maintain or demolish the building on the site because it was really in terrible condition, and keep the site clean of weeds, litter, and garbage, which were continuing problems for the community. September 30th, 2009, the OM OMB appeal resulted in a temporary parking lot for three years. The applicant was to submit the site plan control on or before the 31st of December 2009. But it seems to have taken until January 23rd, 2012 for the site plan to be approved. And that site plan had temporary um, landscaping with some planters that appeared for the first summer and then disappeared during the winter and never reappeared after that. The three-year temporary zoning seems to have run out January 23rd, 2015. Since that time, the HCA and the neighbors have been asking what's going on, why is this still continuing? This one property has resulted in a huge cost to the taxpayer for all the city staff time required to police it for more than 12 years. For zoning non-compliance, property standards, there was some work done without a permit and a stop work order, graffiti. And in some of the previous, well, there are some pictures there of some illegal construction that was going on. And one of the pictures Linda had up earlier was how the parking encroaches onto the city land and in fact sometimes hangs out over onto the sidewalk in some instances as this picture shows here. So in the wintertime that makes it really difficult for snow plowing. When I went by this morning, between those cars parked like that and trucks parked on the snowbank right at the curb, it was very difficult to get down. There was snow all over the sidewalk, um, and the plow could not get down. Also, the site plan from 2012 appears to show 28 parking spots, as well as the report from staff talks about 28 parking spots. Yesterday and today, there are 37 spots being used. So again, there's a compliance issue that, again, bylaw is going to have to deal with if you approve this plan. So two years won't mean two years. Just as, as the 2009 OMB re ruling for three years brings us to today, 10 years later, there are, will be lots and lots of bylaw calls, property standards calls, etc. So please deny this application. Thank you. Is it Cheryl? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Leeper. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Cheryl Linda, for the presentation. Uh, and thanks for making it really easy for me to make my comments uh, in the staff report because I was able to simply use your comments. It was a, an eloquent stating of why this shouldn't be allowed to move ahead. I've spoken with a number of my colleagues to ask them to please reject this application, and I'll reiterate that this morning. I really am seeking to um, send a, a strong message to not just uh, this applicant, but applicants who have seemingly taken for granted that temporary parking exemptions for three years are essentially uh, 
time unlimited uh, exemptions. Um, I, I share with you the same belief that uh, these are not temporary exemptions, they are simply exemptions because council has not been willing to uh, yank those exemptions when the time comes up. But what is, I, I just want to make sure I understand, what is the desired outcome on the part of the HCA from rejecting this application? Where do we go from here? We would like to certainly encourage um, development of that site. It, it's, it's a desolate site. There's often issues trying to get by on the sidewalk if you're a pedestrian. Um, so we would like to see this developed into housing, which we really need. Linda, did you want to... Oh. Given the number of applications that we see coming before us, us um, as a zoning committee and that you see in your office, um, there's a demand. Uh, I think if the applicant was interested, he could find a partner and or he could sell the site. People want to live in Hintonburg and people want to develop low-rise apartment buildings in Hintonburg. Fantastic. All right. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, now I have uh, Lloyd Phillips. Thank you, uh, Linda and Cheryl. You did promise me a lot of pictures yesterday, Linda. Thank you. With Lloyd is Farooz Hatam, the owner. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the uh, committee. My name is Lloyd Phillips. Uh, I'm the uh, planning consultant and agent for the owner, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Farooz Hatami, uh, representing his numbered company. Um, I'm going to make some comments, and then Mr. Hatami will follow and make his comments. Um, I'm not going to cover the history because that's already been well uh, covered by the previous speakers, and I'm not going to cover the, I'll say, all the planning designations and so forth. I have no issue of what, what's been said there. Um, what I do want to say, though, is that, um, we first of all, we support the staff recommendation in the report uh, for a two-year term. We applied for three, and staff said, you know, we, we are, we're, we're willing to uh, let you go for two. And so if we haven't gotten through uh, into the desired development end state, as I think as you've just heard, uh, then we'd have to apply uh, for another extension and take our chances at that time. We certainly understand and the concerns expressed by the Hentonburg Community Association and the councillor. Um, the lot is not pretty, uh, but it certainly has its own useful function in this community for the time being. Um, we share the long-term uh, planning goals that there would be some development but uh, on this property, but that's when the time is right and when the owner is ready. And uh, refusal of this application is not going to change anything or force a new development. Um, the parking that is provided reduces pressure on the local streets. Um, one of the major users of this lot is the World University Services, which is just down the street. Re refusal of the application will result in adverse impacts on the neighborhood and on World University Services and other people who use this, um, uh, this parking lot and on the owner who still has to pay taxes whether or not there is parking. And regarding the, I'll say, the length of this has been used for parking, uh, there are many examples of where temporary zoning has gone on long after three years and with, uh, uh, I'll say, renewals uh, without main, I'll say, undermining the long-term intent. Uh, the Rideau Centre, for example, had temporary parking for almost 20 years on the space that's now occupied by the recent expansion uh, where Simons is located. So. Things will get done when they're ready to be done. Um, this temporary parking lot does not preclude any long-term planning intent for the site, as you've already heard, uh, for a modest scale traditional main street, mixed use or some other development. And on the matter of the planter boxes, the owner certainly commits to returning those in the spring uh, when the conditions permit. So with all of that, uh, we request that the planning committee uh, approve the staff recommendation. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gower? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think what I'm concerned about in this is uh, how long this will be temporary and whether or not the applicant would be back here. And if we approve this today, whether or not the applicant would be back here in two years asking for an extension. In the staff report, it says the owner is confident that the two-year extension will allow the opportunity to create a transition plan, which is far from having an actual timeline. And I just heard from Mr. Phillips things like when the time is right, the when the developer is ready, or things will get things will get done when they're ready to get done. What's a realistic time frame for when this developer will be ready to build? Is it two years? Is it four years? Is it completely unknown? I question the owner. And councillors, uh, I'm in the land assembly Business. You're going to have to speak uh, I'm in the land, land assembly business, and uh, there is a last property on the corner that I have to buy in order to finish the whole square. And that's when, when that is done, definitely it would be for sale. But at this moment, which is I'm losing one corner, is not very tentative for the buyers to buy. So I would appreciate the opportunity to allow me to go ahead until the land assembly is done and it would be for sale. And also I wanted to add that prior to the temporary parking that I applied a few years ago, I applied for the permanent parking permit when I bought the property. In a month I got my permanent parking permit in my hand. After eight months, city revoked that permit. And after I went through the $40,000 expense, put asphalt and buy new machine to put there, and city just, been, just said that you cannot continue parking lot. So it cost me another $45,000 to get a lawyer and to go to that gym. committee of adjustment and everything to get for three years. So in a matter of, in a matter of six years, we have spent over $90,000 just to get three years permit. And that is not that much amount of the money from the 28 spot we can make. So you know that. So it's just pay for the taxes, pay for some of the uh, snow removal, and create, you know, it give an opportunity. In this case, you know, when there is a parking lot there, everybody is winning. I'm winning, city is winning, getting his taxes. People that they need the parking overnight banding, they, they have parking lot. The Sword University, which is the biggest need of the area, needs a parking lot. They are, they are having it. And that is, I think, we are, everybody is winning and everybody is happy. By stopping it, I think the only person, only, only, only body would gain of it is the city of Ottawa gets its taxes, Doesn't whether I'm the owner or somebody else is the owner. So I appreciate if you consider all this point and give us a chance to go ahead until I finish the land assembly and I put the land for the sale. And also, it's a harvest time of my life, and I don't want to lose the opportunity. This is my retirement plan, and I have to, I don't work for the city or for the, uh, con uh, for the government, so this is, this is the way that we do business and we are looking to do the harvest at the time that comes right and to, to get our retirement money. Questions? Uh, thank you. Did you want to speak also or are you just here for questions? Uh, Mr. Hatam. No, 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 I finish. No, I finish. Okay, thank good. Uh, we have one other councillor to ask questions, uh, Councillor Moffat. Thank you. Just um, a couple of questions. One to begin. Um, if this committee would approve it, would you have applied for a permanent parking lot on this site? Like, is it, would it be your preference that this would have a permanent zoning that would permit parking on this site? In the ideal world, yes, but this, the official plan uh, doesn't allow for that. So that's why it's a temporary rezoning. And the reason why I ask is I think it, it, it does help frame a bit your intent with the site. Um, so in this case, you have a zoning in place, you have an official plan designation in place that permits development. You have a community association that supports development on the site. 
knowing full well that when this site gets developed, it will not be to the 14.5 meter cap on the site and that rezoning will come forward and it will be much higher than that. So given my experience with community associations and communities embracing the stagnant nature of certain sites, um, it's quite refreshing to see someone actually wants to see development on a site in congruence with the way it's zoned. So what steps, knowing that, knowing the designation of the property, knowing that you've had multiple extensions or multiple um, approvals of a temporary use of this site, uh, what steps have you taken since the last temporary use was granted to advance development on this site? Specifically this site, not other sites nearby, this one. Um, as H Mr. Hatami has mentioned, he's been working on a land assembly uh, okay, and he has one more piece to go, as he mentioned earlier, to, to complete the land assembly and the intention is to do that, uh, put the land up for sale and then the development can proceed. So this is really sort of an, I'll say, an interim measure to make use of the property uh, without, and we don't think that it's going to deflect any uh, future development. There's always the possibility during the uh, temporary period that he will acquire the land and the land can be sold and then the parking use will end. But there's also a possibility that the, the piece of land he's looking to buy may not be available for 10 years. Who knows? You're okay. right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming up. Okay. Um, you said your dues? Pardon? Okay. So on this item, would, yeas and nays. Did you request that, Councillor Leeper? Okay, yeas and nays on the motion to extend, basically to extend the uh, permission for parking for a two-year period. Uh, Councillor Dudas? No. Councillor Gower? No. Councillor Shirelli. Councillor Leeper. No. Councillor Brockington. Yes. Councillor Blake. Yes. Did you say yes? Councillor Moffat. No. Councillor Hubley. Vice Chair Tierney. And myself, no. It's four to three. So it does pass. Or, I, why was yes? Blay, Brockington, and me. Five to two. Who did? You said no. Oh, sorry, I meant no. Sorry, I meant no. Yeah. Okay, so it's five to two. Does everybody admit? Allow me to change it to no. It's four to two. See, I actually have my my figures here. When I'm writing down, I write down three. Okay, it's confusing. I'm glad that Councillor Hubley's here. Anyway. Just for the record, it was five to two. You have five to two? Yeah. The two yeses were Brockington and Blake and the rest and, were... And me. You said no. I, but we just changed. Never mind. It you doesn't matter. I don't care. See, actually, I was right the first time. What I wanted to say, I just surprised you. That's all. You're all just shocked. See, you see, I know I have a concussion, everybody, but actually what I said was right. I was voting against it. So then everybody argued with me, and now you got me registered as a yes. Well, whatever. I said no. Anyway, it doesn't matter because it's still the same uh, overall result. Thank you. <laughs> the next item up. is a uh, zoning bylaw amendment for 3809 Boris O'Kane Road. And on this one, I, uh, Mr. Willis has asked me to provide time, and we are going to be moving a deferral, but we're not moving the deferral until after uh, staff have had a chance to uh, provide clarification on uh, some of the uh, comments that were made on this file. So, Mr. James, where are you? I'm sitting over here, oh, there you are. Madam Chair, yes on the angle over here. Just easier I can run the 
I can run Perfect. the. Hopefully, and, I can run the clicker. We'll give it a. And a you're quick with Lily. Um, Lily Chu. Lily is uh, Lily Chu is on my left here as well to answer any questions that uh, may come uh, after the presentation or from. And from where's this Mr. Item. Mark? Oh, you see, this is the, this this is like crazy. <laughs> you guys should all sit together. Okay, we're set to go. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of committee. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit um, about the, the project um, here at, uh, on Boris O'Kane, 3809 Boris O'Kane. Um, just as an opportunity to uh, clear up some issues that uh, seem to have risen over the last few days. Um, first of all, I just want to start out uh, by saying that uh, the application uh, to redevelop the site uh, where two applications were submitted in January 2019, uh, zoning and a subdivision, uh, and of course they were to allow the proposed residence um, on what is an old quarry that uh, has been in use uh, since the 1950s. And as committee would probably know, as in relation to applications that are submitted to the city, uh, there is a notification process um, that takes place uh, and that the circulations uh, were sent out, signs are put up, uh, the, the standard uh, notification uh, process with the city. Uh, of course, as part of the circulation, a circulation was uh, done to the Ministry of Natural Resources uh, and Forestry. They were fully engaged in both the zoning and the subdivision process uh, from the start. Um, the applicant had provided all the relevant plans and studies. Um, they were done by professionals. Um, basically, what, what happens uh, with all applications, it should be known that uh, um, professional um, uh, applications are filed, uh, professional um, reports are filed to present positions, and those are sent out um, to various agencies uh, to be reviewed, uh, to be looked at, and, and comments made on those. Um, so when an applicant files these, they're following uh, the um, standard protocol, standard procedures, and that's what the case was here where applications were sent out. And of course, it'd be sent off to the Ministry of Natural Resources uh, for their um, review as well. I just want to stay here on September 9th in 2019, uh, staff uh, in correspondence with the ministry um, indicated uh, that the site was a recently exhausted aggregate extraction, extraction operation uh, and uh, put that point out and you'll see in, of course in the report there is a, uh, a reference to that but at that time um, the, we also asked the ministry of the steps to surrender the aggregate license and it's important to note that in those conversations, the ministry did not refute uh, that the site was exhausted. And of course, they provided a roadmap uh, of how, and I say a roadmap of how the, um, the site uh, should be closed. The aggregate supply was depleted, um, such as the case here. The ministry says this is the process uh, for surrendering that aggregate license, and that was presented to us. Just on the next slide here, I'll go through it uh, briefly. There's eight steps uh, that we discussed with the ministry. One, of course, and I'll get into this first one a little bit later, but uh, uh, the City of Ottawa issues uh, draft subdivision approval. Uh, from that, uh, the licensee uh, submits a request to the ministry. Uh, it's a major site amendment. Uh, there's a rehabilitation plan for the site now, but of course, uh, because now there's going to be homes put, it on, put on the site, uh, they have to revise that rehabilitation plan uh, to reflect uh, the approved draft plan of subdivision. And then once the draft plan of subdivision is completed, of course, then we have steps three and steps four, which relate to that major amendment uh, to the rehabilitation plan that is uh, on the site so that the, so the, um, uh, so that the aggregate license can be surrendered. Uh, the last four steps I'll just talk about uh, here briefly are more uh, in the, um, the letters issued uh, to uh, uh, consenting to this amendment, all the fees have to be paid. Um, and the final step, and of course it's always the ministry that has the final say, uh, is that uh, at that time the ministry would uh, accept the surrender of the license. I just want to talk about with uh, respect to the city's um, role uh, in this. Of course I mentioned about circulating the uh, plans and documents, but um, uh, the ministry itself needs to know um, how to amend the existing rehabilitation plan um, that shows for the proposed land use. So that's why we have to have the uh, draft subdivision approval so they can see what is actually proposed and that was done in uh, November 2019. Uh, what is before the committee today, uh, what the committee has to consider of course is the rezoning of the site. 
Um, the question has come up uh, whether or not uh, this uh, rezoning is uh, premature. Uh, it is not, and to tell the committee now, it is not premature. Uh, there is nothing in legislation, uh, be it the, uh, the Planning Act or the Aggr Aggregate Resources Act that would prohibit uh, the use or the rezoning of the land. I can say that, I'm asked Mr. Mark um, to confirm that. Um, if the count, if uh, committee wishes, but there is nothing to prevent this. And as well, and I'll show this in a second, but there is MNR uh, policies uh, that allow for this. Uh, consideration of the zoning then is not premature. Uh, and of course, with the zoning in place, there's still the process with the ministry uh, that uh, after the license has been surrendered, um, that they have to go through in order to obtain that. So this next slide here, um, basically is an excerpt from uh, a ministry policy, um, uh, policy bulletin from 2006, but it says, and I'll read it out, I know it's a lot of text, but it's important. Uh, in special cases where the intended use, uh, intended after use of the site uh, has significantly changed, and it gives examples, and I think we have there, it's a residential subdivision as a case here, and municipal zoning and official plan approvals have been obtained, so after that, the licensee may request the site plan amendments to vary the rehabilitation requirements in order to be consistent with the approved after use. The request then is processed as a major site plan amendment, as I had mentioned, and the use is a, uh, what is used is the approved grading plan from the draft plan of subdivision. So all these things can take place and should really take place uh, before the license is surrendered. Um, so basically, in conclusion, um, this is an appropriate, of course, an appropriate use of the land. It's an uh, expended uh, uh, aggregate site, um, and uh, the applicant could probably talk to more about that, um, but it will bring, of course, housing uh, to the city of Ottawa. Um, but we thought it was important to note that, uh, to bring to the committee's attention that uh, uh, the process was followed uh, as it should be uh, and nothing is before the committee that would be considered to be premature. And if the committee has any questions, we'd be happy to answer those. Mr. Mark, uh, do you have any um, comments on what uh, Mr. James has just uh, spo uh, spoken to us or presented to us? Madam Chair, I have had the opportunity to review the uh, relevant ministry guidelines uh, and I can confirm that what Mr. James presented is completely consistent with the ministry guidelines. With, what did you say at the end? It's completely consistent with? with the, it is completely, what Mr. James stated is completely consistent with the ministry guidelines. And Mr. James, the, well, I forget which slide it was, that, well, I guess when you had nine or ten things up there, that is the ministry um, procedure? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, staff corresponded with the ministry on the roadmap for the surrender of the license. And this was the roadmap that, uh, or these are the steps that were involved uh, with respect to surrendering that license in the end. And would the applicant be able, or would the ministry be able to go further if we weren't having this report before us today? Well, Madam Chair, the, the ministry has the final say um, at the end of the day about the reuse of the site. They have to go through this process um, to, um, to end up surrendering the license. So they, they, we, we are following our steps uh, under the Planning Act. Uh, we're not jumping the gun. We're not premature. We're allowing something um, that, of course, committee and council will have to decide if the zoning is appropriate for the site. Uh, but uh, the ministry has its own process to follow and no building permits, uh, no development will take place until the license is surrendered. Okay, thank you. Um, just stay here in case somebody else has questions at some point, okay, everybody? Um, next speakers, I have three that have registered individually. Uh, May Pham, where are you May? Come on up. Frank Cairo and David Gilbert, you're coming up together? Okay. And then followed by George Neville. Do you have a presentation? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, we have uh, a series of four slides here that I think might help further clarify. Although I will say that um, Mr. James' presentation was uh, fairly thorough on the matter, so we can be relatively quickly today, uh, quickly moving through these today. Um, 
So I, I don't know if it's just me or I'm not used to this room because usually we're stretching our ears to here in Champlain room, which is one of the reasons why we came here. But can you really work hard at focusing your, your um, words right into the speaker, please? Okay. Thank you. Go ahead whenever you're ready. My apologies. So first off, I'd just like to say uh, good morning and thank you to you, Madam Chair, and members of the committee for um, allowing us the opportunity to present today. Um, we um, felt it was important to clarify not only the steps, um, but also I think what's been an inadvertent uh, conflation of issues related to this file. Um, there is two parallel tracks that have occurred here. One track um, with respect to the redevelopment of the site relates to whether or not the mineral resource on site has in fact been depleted and or exhausted. The second parallel track is the process by which the license itself is surrendered or retired under the Aggregate Resource Act. At the end of the day, um, I think that much of the uh, confusion surrounding the file relates to the fact that um, having the mineral resource exhausted that is not necessarily a statutory approval process. That is a technical um, determination that gets made based on the actual quality of the resource itself and the required grading to rehabilitate the site. Obviously, the retirement of the license is a process in and of itself. It does have statutory and regulatory framework that I think has been covered well today by Mr. James and, and also clarified by Mr. Mark. I'm not going to take a lot of time here other than I will say, if you look at the image on the screen before you, the process, uh, and we've bucketed those steps up into six uh, discrete uh, steps to bring us to a surrender of license uh, under the parallel framework between the Planning Act and the Aggregate Resource Act. Um, today we are talking about what would be point number four on the chart, which is zoning approval. The completion of the major site plan amendment process with the MNRF still remains outstanding, as would number six, which is the surrender of license. Um, we have not said there's been no uh, indication at all uh, by anyone on, involved in the file that this process has been completed. We are here to complete a step um, in order to get to the ultimate uh, surrender of that license under the Act. Um, I'm not going to deal with project status uh, unless there's any specific questions. Um, this is a aerial photo with a draft plan overlay of the subject property. Uh, you can see uh, clearly that there's uh, mining operations that have gone on. The lands that um, are immediately north, and I'm going to try my best here with this laser. Um, yeah, just because like most people in the room probably aren't, don't know anything about Barhaven, it would be helpful if you point out the direction Strandherd is, the direction Barnsdale is, and, and Boris O'Kane used to be called Cedarview. And where the 416 is, that probably would be a, and the Jock River, those major um, identifiers. Yes, thank you. So this uh, pointer is not working, unfortunately, but I'll, I'll say that if you look at the large arterial road on the west side or the left side of the plan, um, that is Boris O'Kane. Um, south of the property, um, separated by uh, a couple of parcels, would be Barnsdale Road. North of the property, um, separated by a number of parcels, would be Strander Drive. So if you follow Boris O'Kane north or moving uh, up the screen, you would reach Strander Drive. Uh, left would be the 416 and right would be uh, eventually Green Bank. So this is a, in an area known as South Barhaven. The lands immediately east of this are developing in the South Barhaven um, Community Design Plan area, uh, which is uh, under development and draft plans being filed and, and approved there. We are essentially um, a continuation of that community design plan that has been established. Uh, these lands have been designated for development. The intent in the official plan and several OPAs that have um, been brought forward to committee for approval have shown these as lands that are priority for development. Um, and we are fulfilling steps required to actually implement that development uh, that has been uh, guided by the official plan itself. Um, the, the two blocks you see that front Boris O'Kane are future development blocks. The more um, intense um, blocking you see to the east um, represents the residential subdivision, which also includes a park. Um, I'm going to get to the next slide um, just in a moment. We're going to delve uh, surficially in some of the technical aspects of whether or not 
we can confidently say that the mineral resource itself has been exhausted. If you look at the two letters A and then the two letters B, those correspond to cross sections um, of the site that if you look at this uh, elevation of the site, and I apologize for the technical image, I think it's unfortunately gonna be important that I clarify a couple of matters related to the site. The red line you see uh, that is in both of these section drawings corresponds to the required grading for the site to tie into the adjoining residential land uses. So as you can tell, the red line is much higher in elevation than the existing floor of the pit. The floor of the pit you can see with undulating terrain is represented by uh, the other lines that um, are obviously in difference to that red line which is at a higher elevation. This, um, it's for this reason that we can confidently say that the, the, the resource has been exhausted. In fact, what's interesting about the site is we're actually importing fill in order to bring the site up to the required grading um, to rehabilitate the site. Uh, there has never been any um, uh, equivocal commentary about the, the resource not being exhausted for that fact. We have to bring fill in in order to complete this project and have the grading represent a rehabilitation line that's consistent with the adjoining land uses. Um, you can see in the notes section here, and I apologize for the small font, um, this presentation doesn't really lend well for a large room, um, but the Aggregate Resource Act actually specifically gives clarification which I find helpful on what is deemed to be an exhausted resource under the Act. And it actually specifically references the fact that um, grading required on site, um, building of roads or construction of that infrastructure where aggregate that exists on site is going to be used for the development of that site, um, the, the aggregate resource is deemed to have been exhausted. So in this case, there are a couple piles of material that you can see um, on the top image. Those piles are mineral, but the truth is they are being used on site as part of the cut and fill, and we are in a deficit situation where fill has to be brought in to complete the development. So these are just clarifications that I think help deal with, outside of the process framework, the definition on whether or not, technically speaking, the mineral resource has been exhausted on site, which clearly it has. To continue, and I'm not expecting anyone to read the font uh, up on the screen right here, but um, we have retained um, an outside party, Grell and Associates, to actually look at the mineral re resource, forgetting the fact that we require it on site and we're actually in a shortfall of fill on site, to look at the mineral resource and to ask, actually address whether or not the quality of the resource itself um, would, would uh, necessitate further extraction. And what's interesting about this professional opinion uh, is that the quality of the resource that remains on site, even if it was surplus to the need of the site, would not be worthwhile harvesting because of the poor quality of what remains. So at the end of the day, we have uh, a site here that has been exhausted, the quality mineral aggregate had been removed, and now what remains needs to stay on site in order for us to harmonize our efforts with the adjoining residential uses. Um, so I, I just wanted to clarify a couple of these matters, both technical and process, and obviously uh, attend today to answer any questions that, that, that staff or um, committee would have on this matter. Um, but I, I hope that this ha has helped clarify, um, you know, in a really brief nutshell, the framework by which this application is before you. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? Can I uh, just put that other Schleifer. slide uh, back up, please? Schleifer. Sorry. You're not, you're like, you're not on the thing, so I'm, that's what oh. I was asking, and you just started, which is great. Go ahead. I, I'm just wondering, if we could put the letter back up again, please. Does that letter say that the site is exhausted or not, and, and what difference does that make in terms of the process? As I read the final paragraph of that, they're not saying it's exhausted, but they're saying it's not very good material. Is that different from exhausted, and does that make a difference in the process? Are you asking Frank? Th thank you, uh, uh, through you, Madam Chair, to, to you, uh, Council, Council Leeper. Th thank you for the question. So the, the letter itself um, was intended to address the quality of the resource as a supplementary piece of information um, related to whether or not the resource is ex exhausted. The actual resource uh, is deemed exhausted technically based on the balance line required to rehabilitate the site. So in short, 
the fill that's left on site right now is needed to redevelop the site and therefore the, the resource has been exhausted. The memo just sp strictly deals with the quality of the material um, and is not intended to speak to whether or not the resource is exhausted from a balanced line on site perspective, which this image here prepared by Patterson and um, consulting engineers has, has addressed. Does this figure into a determination by the ministry, however, that the site is in their declaration as to whether the site is exhausted or not? The ministry, since, in fact, before we uh, became involved in the site, uh, had been deeply involved in the operations on site, and much even in advance of our involvement, they had made moves to start the rehabilitation process of the pit because the resource was exhausted. Um, the Ministry of Natural Resources doesn't formally, under any approval framework, deem things to be exhausted or not. That technical definition is left to um, a site-specific circumstance. Site-specifically, um, whether a mineral resource is exhausted or not relates technically to whether or not there's enough resource on site to allow for the rehabilitation uh, with compatible land uses that surround. So the fact that we have a shortfall of fill to complete this development and to ha have grading tie into the adjoining lands by default means that the mineral resource has been exhausted. And the ministry has confirmed their agreement in that regard. And that's, and forgive me, Chair, but that's what I'm confused about is on page six of the report, we have that line that I think raised some questions on, in the part of councillors. Uh, the lands were previously utilized for mineral resource extraction operations. The extraction operation has recently ended as the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry has deemed the site to be exhausted of aggregate and no longer requiring protection. It sounds like that is a requirement for the rest of the, the process to move ahead, is that determination that the site is exhausted of the aggregate. Who says it's exhausted and based on what? And, and forgive me, but I appreciate your patience with it. It's, uh, it's not a process I'm very you know, familiar and, with. And so let's, let's, act, let's actually get Mr. Mark to comment on sure. that. So there's no like... Immediate. Madam Chair, in one of the slides that was presented by Mr. James, and it may not have been noted by members of the committee at the time, uh, there was a reference to a communication between city staff and the ministry. City staff wrote in an email to the ministry that the site had been exhausted. The ministry responded with the surrender procedure and the ministry did not challenge the statement by staff in that communication that the site had been exhausted. They didn't challenge it, they didn't refute it, but I, I just want to understand who does make that determination that the site is exhausted? Yes, so um, through you Madam Chair, um, to address the question I would say that it's a technical uh, determination made by professional engineers um, that doesn't require an approval of the MNRF uh, explicitly under any legislation. Whether or not the mineral resource is exhausted is a mere technical um, determination that in the case of this site has been made by um, the engineers involved in the file and is solidified by the fact that we have a shortfall of fill material on site. So the, the, the resource, um, there is no more mining available to us, even if there was good quality material to remove. Removing that material would mean that we have to import back material. So just to give an example, if I took one truckload of material off site, and I'm not suggesting we have good material to do that, but let's just say we did, that one truckload of material that I'd remo remove would have to be replaced in future by the same truckload of material coming back. That's why, from an environmental, economic, and also uh, uh, nuisance perspective, the ministry does not want to see aggregate operations continue only for material to be coming back to the pit with carbon footprint and with all the uh, noxious possibilities that come from you know, big trucks moving on arterial roads hauling fill needlessly. So the short story is the technical determination of whether our resource has been exhausted is in the realm of professional engineering and opinions of professional engineers. And in the case of this file, uh, that determination was made by David Schaefer Engineering and Patterson, Patterson Group here in Ottawa. And it was never contested. And therefore, um, our position is that um, there's never been a contest that the resource has been exhausted. And therefore, um, we feel that there's been comfort that everyone agrees that it has been. Okay, that's, uh, that's very helpful. Uh, I, I will have a question for staff around the wording that was in the report, but I can wait until after the delegations. So for, the, for staff, if, um, 
why then did the report say that uh, MNFR has deemed the site to be exhausted of aggregate if the determination of exhaustion is not actually MNRFs to make, but is in fact, I guess the developers, engineers have the purview to make that determination? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. It was, uh, as Mr. Markin, as I had mentioned earlier in, in the slide, it was uh, a statement that we made to the Ministry of Natural Resources, uh, and they did not refute it. Uh, we, as I mentioned as well in my presentation, um, professional, um, pre uh, professional positions are taken uh, by engineers that this site, um, the quality of the fill, uh, whether or not there is any fill left to be taken out of there, those are presented and those are reviewed. And it was not res mentioned uh, uh, by the uh, by the applicant. It was not refuted by as well uh, by the Ministry of Natural Resources. So in our conversations with the ministry, uh, that there's this site is appropriate for redevelopment for residential homes. Uh, as I mentioned, it's been a, an aggregate since uh, re-extraction facility since about the 1950s. Uh, that it was appropriate in this instance to say that uh, in conversations with them that the site indeed was exhausted. And again, as I mentioned, it wasn't refuted, but it was presented in prof as professional positions uh, within documents, uh, professional uh, reports that were presented. So if I understand properly on the, the deferral and having this file come back to us at some point in the future, there would be a change in language in this paragraph to be more explicit around well, did I'm, not I'm, refute? So just... To clarify that, because we are going to clarify that, the deferral, that's why it's not on the floor, has nothing to do with this conversation. So this language... It is not the reason why the... Well, and you'll hear about that. Yep. All right. Thank you, Chair. We, and that's why SPICE specifically did not put the deferral forward. So because, as you know, once you have a deferral forward, you can only put uh, on the table, you can only speak to deferral, which is why I'm going to have... I don't know whether Mr. Neville came to speak to deferral or whether he came to speak to the item, but because he's the fourth one signing up, he's going to be the fourth one to speak to the report, right? So you'll, you'll hear about that. Um, just one, so I think this probably is Mr. Mark, but, well, actually, first of all, it's Mr. James. So is this the first aggregate pit that's been retired that we've ever redeveloped within the urban boundary of the city of Ottawa? And you're, well, Maybe in your recollection, but there's other people in the room that have been. In my recollection, of course, yes, but I'll, I'll defer to if, see if Lily has anything or she can think of a. So that process you site. had up there was from 2006, I think, right? Pardon me, Madam Chair? I think on, on somebody's slide it said 2006 that that was when this process. That I was, guess my question is yeah. can, can the ministry take a next, its next step? without this being played out? With, without the rezoning being played out? There's a major rehabilitation, well, the, I think that the zoning should be in place, which was put on to the, uh, the slide was in another document that was up there, but um, the zoning, and we don't need an official plan amendment, but if it needed to be done, it should be done before that, the way that policy reads, uh, it sh those things should be taken care of. But the ministry can go ahead, of course, then, and uh, do, it hasn't done it yet, it's 30-day um, posting for the um, uh, redevelopment or the rehabilitation, new rehabilitation plan that's in uh, align with the subdivision. It hasn't done that yet, um, but they will be doing that soon, um, but uh, uh, the zoning should be in place as well as in accordance with that uh, document that was uh, put up. From a legal perspective, Mr. Mark, is there anything else to add? I confirm the comments that Mr. James just made, Madam Chair. So that's why we're having this conversation, because Mr. Willis wanted his staff to be able to come before us and explain this procedure, which we wouldn't have any conversation about this. They would have gone about their procedure because of a policy, brought the ap application to us as they do, excuse me, as they do, and we would be here where we're going to be right now after I have, if no one has any more questions, any questions of, uh, of, of, of uh, May, Frank, or David? Okay, so, I'm, so thank you very much for coming out. Thank um, you. Actually, Frank, I think everybody else sit down, but I think I need you to stay there because I, I'm going to, on deferral, you're going to need to speak to what happened to trigger what Lily decided. Okay? Fair enough. So we have everything on the table.
Where are you, Mr. Neville? Come on down. You, um, David and May, you're going to take your seats back in the audience. George, come on over one more just to make sure we've got working mics. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Uh, I guess I'm here for a wrap-up. I, I signed the, um, I filled in the, the information sheet uh, and requested the privilege of, of, of speaking because uh, I wanted to keep my options open. I didn't want to um, tick off opposed or approve because uh, uh, at this stage we don't know where we're at. Uh, I welcome the questions of uh, Councillor Leeper. Um, the, the, this, um, this matter is before us because um, uh, it was exposed by a CBC reporter with regard to procedures here. Uh, the matter was uh, uh, pulled from the agenda and then it was indicated as being on and, and with some clarification, which we got from in part by Mr. James and, uh, and so on. So that's where it is right now. Um, um, the, the matter of, um, of the, uh, the sand pit operation, referred to an aggregate, but it's, it's sand. Uh, this, um, the matter of, uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of its release by the Ministry of Natural Resources, that's a matter, to my understanding, that has to be requested. Uh, and then, then that sets forth the operation of uh, assessment and, and determination. And I think that this is beyond a little bit more than just professional engineers. Surely this is a geological matter, a geological engineering, and, and uh, environmental assessment as well. And the reason I say that is that uh, sand pits in that area, Long Barnsdale, are uh, quite well known um, for um, having artesian springs below them. And uh, I'm a little taken aback by the fact that Phil is being brought in of, of some of it referred to here by Frank is, uh, is obnoxious. Uh, this uh, this uh, presents a potential uh, uh, contamination to, to groundwater with the springs coming up to the base of the excavated area. And as far as the question is, is this the first city's uh, um, consideration of uh, remediation of a of a pit. Well, it's not. The Trail Road site is a key example of this, of course. This goes back to the time of Aubrey Moody, the Reeve of Nepean at that time. Excuse me, did you just mention Trail Road? I, I, yes. And what did you say about Trail Road? Well, that's, that was uh, be the first classic example of a remediation of a sand pit for other purposes. That was all excavated uh, sand there, and also to the area immediately to the west of that, the corner of Cambrian, uh, be the south west corner of Cambrian and uh, Moody Drive. That that's uh, 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 now extracted uh, sand pit too, and uh, in fact, it's full of artesian springs. There's a creek running down there, uh, a ditch that's been run through there, westerly over to the Leamy Creek for drainage of the spring water within that area. And it shows you. And there's another a good example on the northwest corner of uh, Barnsdale Road and Moody Drive of a whole series of uh, artesian springs that bubble up right to the surface in the winter time amid the cedars in there. And if you go further north on, on uh, Moody Drive where the, uh, the other um, operations are there, there's ponding of water and, and um, to some depth in some places. So th these, are, these are real critical matters that uh, I think are beyond just the usual professional engineer, which in most cases is a civil engineer. It requires geological and environmental consideration, environmental engineering, if you like. So that's why I'm here, is to dr draw attention to a few of these factors and to elicit a little bit more information because on the basis of the file, the information that was put and all the rest, um, um, we really don't have enough information at our, uh, at our, our fingerprints at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. I don't see any questions. I, 
Um, I will tell you, though, Mr. Neville, that as you call it, the CBC expose, I think you said, uh, did trigger a number of things to happen. Um, I can say that uh, none of them were good. Um, and um, they were indeed inflammatory. And I think maybe it's not even the report that was done, but it was the title that was given to it that contradicted what I think the intent was, but I'm just guessing, of the what you call CBC expose. Um, this item never was pulled from the agenda. If it was pulled from the agenda, we wouldn't have it before us today. Um, the only reason for the deferral is going to be commented on uh, in the next step of what we're going to do, and it has nothing to do with any of the preamble to what we talked about today, with the exception of probably the grading because it's an aggregate. I will also let you know, Mr. Neville, because I've been around long enough and I've been in Barhaven a very long time, that when we built Minto Rec, and you're talking about some soil being brought in from another place, yeah, that's one of the things that the province under uh, Steve Clark has just made some changes to because we have natural to Barhaven something called barium in the, in the soil. What was happening with the old rules was that any soil with barium was not allowed to be used for development, so we were carting away the very soil that was natural to Barhaven to bring back other soil from wherever you could get it. And I'll give you a, a great example. We had to close down Cambrian Road one Saturday when we were building Minto Rec in the very early stages of it. So probably about 2012, 2013. I remember it well. We had a caravan of dump trucks. I think there were 50 or 60 that had to bring in soil from outside of Barhaven. Um, that was going to be that. But what we ended up doing is we, the, the mayor sent a letter to the ministry saying, this is ridiculous, okay? I mean, just the... Um, greenhouse gas emissions and everything, 50 trucks, you can just imagine what it, what it looked like in having to close down a major arterial and to bring it from wherever, probably somewhere in the west, to that point. So we were able to logically say, let us use the, the fill that we're having to take out of our stormwater pond that Minto is creating to the west of, to the east of what is now Longfields, near Heart's Desire, near uh, Paul Mativier. So we created a huge stormwater, beautiful, park-like looking place there. They actually allowed us to use the land, that we, the, the soil that was being taken over there because it made sense. Okay? So that's why that was part of the conversation here is that um, in this case, at some point when the aggregate no longer becomes valuable, or I guess are viable, there's a recognition that that can still contribute to the grading that you have to uh, come up with. And, and thanks, Frank, because I haven't seen either of those slides before. We wouldn't be having this discussion today. I think that uh, it's one that maybe uh, when Councillor Moffat was at uh, ARAC, uh, you would have seen there. Uh, because I would consider Scott to be our specialist on council when it comes to knowing stuff about, a about aggregate because, you know, we do have a lot. And I don't know about the East End, Councillor Blay, you would know more about that, but we have a ton of aggregate places in the, uh, in, in the, in the West End. So this won't be the first time we see this. But anyways, what we have before us is we have uh, somebody who, uh, in this case, uh, Kai Van, who uh, purchased the Brazo pit. Um, and now, Mr. James, back in two, somebody told me that in 2018, M, uh, MNRF and somebody from the city walked that land, that pit, back in 2018. Do we, anybody remember who that was? Don remembers. Here he comes. Madam Chair, it would have been uh, Robin Vandalan from uh, the policy group that would have walked that, probably in relation to the community design plan or a secondary plan that's in the area. So back in 2018, that happened. Um, I don't know when you bought this land, but were you on that walk? Mm 
Madam Chair, um, there were actually several several interactions and on-site visits with the MNRF and uh, the operator at the time of the pit. Uh, there was another uh, walk with uh, Robin Vandalin from the City of Ottawa. There was also a walk with our staff. And during those walks, it was verbally discussed um, at multiple times that um, there was no more aggregate left to be, to be harvested from, from the quarry. And in fact, Robin's walk with MNRF was dedicated to asking that question, and he came away satisfied that MNRF was in agreement that there was no aggregate left to be extracted. So that is, um, I think, a relevant point. Um, but it's just one site visit of a lot of interaction over many years that occurred between the previous operator as well as us and the MNRF. Okay. So the other th reason that we thought this was important, uh, Vice Chair Tierney, thank you. This is your big day. So excited well, you, for you. You started it off. Um, well, anyway, I'm so excited for you. The, um, you know, we wanted this to come forward because we have heard from, uh, I, I have a, uh, my senior planner, well, I say my, but it's in Barhaven, uh, senior planner for some other areas uh, that reports to Lily now. Lily used to be the senior planner, but Sean Moore, uh, held a community meeting last Thursday night, a Minto community meeting. Now, normally when you have a plan, when you have a meeting in the suburbs, okay, unless there's a really good reason for people to show up, you might have, like this application did at its meeting that it was held at Minto Rec, which is in the report, two people show up. I can probably even tell you who they were without knowing who they are. And they just hang out at that stuff. We're interested in what's happening. Been farming it since the 50s, right? So, in this case, he has 30 people show up for the second stage of Minto Harmony, okay? And he's called a liar, and people are saying that the developers in Barhaven are all liars, they're not to be trusted, the city's not to be trusted in the process, etc. So that's why it's important for Mr. Willis to have his staff, for the record, show how very competently they followed the procedures according to the policy with regard to the aggregate, but also the policy and procedures that we have here at the city that they operate under the Planning Act of Ontario. And that's why we've taken this time. So now we're going to go on to, unless you have anything to add, we're going to go on to uh, what happened a couple of weeks ago, um, too close to this report going live uh, for a new, uh, technical nuance, if you will, to change the report modestly. Um, Frank, why don't you say what happened? Your, one of your people came in, and then Lily, I go over to you, and then uh, Mr. Moffat, Councillor Moffat's going to move uh, the deferral. Okay. So. Okay. So Frank, why did you need to make a change, or why why did you want to? Um, Madam Chair, in the process of bringing forward the zoning bylaw amendment, uh, site-specific zoning uh, was developed to accommodate some new architectural designs that we had been advancing, and staff required additional time to consider and vet those uh, requested changes that we are proposing to accommodate the architecture on site. And for that reason, um, we weren't in a position to have um, staff support the zoning today. They needed more time to consider it, and therefore it was being shifted to a committee date in February. We had no objection to that, um, but we wanted to make sure that um, the technical zoning was fully vetted by staff, and it was merely uh, technical vetting that uh, prevented us the ability to have the zoning go forward today for approval. How many units were, are, are roughly are impacted by what you want to do to make it better? The zoning um, exceptions that are uh, proposed that needed further vetting relate to a small component of the site that uh, benefits from some complicated grading conditions, um, which tie into the discussion we had earlier about complicated site grading. Um, and some setback modifications to relate to that grading are the ones that held up our ability to proceed with approval today. Um, it's a small component of the site uh, in perimeter locations that requires that zoning uh, consideration. Um, and staff, uh, in fairness, needs time to consider it thoroughly, and, and that's why uh, we're, we're not being considered for approval today. Thank you. Lily, let's wrap this up before the motion. 
Um, Madam Chair, um, because staff only received confirmation from the applicant um, that they agreed to delay the report so that we can have sufficient time to identify the appropriate locations to accept further exceptions under the zoning standard provisions. Um, that's why the report needs to be delayed to the next one. So, if we were just to take two weeks step back, there is nothing unordinary or out or exceptional about this application. You have a few couple of changes. Your staff want to have the time to review it um, as they always do. And we had this, uh, we were up against today's timeline. So there's a deferral motion from Councillor Moffat. Whereas the report ACS 2020 PIE PS 0009, Zoning Bylaw Amendment 3809 Borussia Cane Road details Zoning Bylaw Amendments recommended to permit the development on, of the lands as a subdivision. And whereas the applicant has requested the city to consider modifications for the zoning in respect of performance standards for the front yard, minimum lot area, and rear yard setback. And whereas city staff advised on January 9th, 2020, that it would be necessary to defer the report from January 23rd, 2020 to the following meeting of planning committee to give proper consideration to the requested modifications. Therefore, be it resolved that planning committee defer the report for the zoning bylaw amendment for 3809 Boris O'Kane Road to the next scheduled planning committee meeting on February 13th, 2020. Thank you very much. Anybody have anything to speak to refer to deferral? Thank you, Frank. Um, you can sit down. Okay, so on deferral. Thank you. Okay, the next uh, held item is um, Councillor Meehan. Did anyone tell you that um, the item that's in yours and uh, George's area uh, was carried? The 4800 and 4836 Bank Street. Huh? No, it was. Just, it just was carried. Nobody had any questions, and nobody came out to speak. I just, I'm just for your information because it's because it relates to you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the next item is uh, 116 York Street. Uh, Anne O'Connor is the planner on file. Uh, we have um, uh, we have the applicant is here. Um, Peter Ferguson is here. Peter, are you here? Come on down. Followed by Carrie Thompson. Is Carrie here? Oh, there you are. Hi, Carrie. And then followed by David Fleming. Where's you, David? I know I saw him. Okay, Mr. Ferguson, you have uh, five minutes. You're with the Lower Town Community Association. Yes, I am. I'm Vice President and uh, Acting Chair of the Planning Committee. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to briefly um, remind councillors of the letter that's included in the report that's under discussion here, two-page letter from September 2018. Um, the position taken in that letter remains our position today. I do want to point out that on January 13th, uh, the board of the Lower Town Community Association invited the, de the developer to make a presentation. He did. Uh, we had a useful discussion uh, without rancor, I might add. Uh, but the position of the association remains as it appears in the letter. Let me very quickly summarize the two main points that we make uh, in the letter. Uh, the proposal uh, fails to contemplate the heritage character of the Heritage Conservation District and the negative impact that it will have on it. And secondly, it represents inappropriate development for the site which would result in insufficient separation distances between existing and future buildings on adjacent properties. And that's the crux of our position. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Ferguson? No? Thanks for coming. Um, Carrie, Carrie Thompson. Who's what? So thank you, Chair and members of committee. I am here this morning as uh, a concerned citizen of the City of Ottawa. And I have three comments to offer for the consideration of committee. First of all, I want to thank planning staff 
for what I think is a very helpful, thoughtful, and insightful report pertaining to this matter. I support it, so I'm speaking in support of the staff recommendation that committee and hopefully council will refuse the approvals that the applicant is seeking. So the first comment that I would offer is it appears to me that the proposed development is very confrontational and insensitive to the area that we're speaking about. One that is subject to a heritage designation. One that in good weather is really just a short walk away from Parliament Hill in what is the capital city of Canada. And I think the city generally, but the neighborhood in particular, deserves more. And so uh, my comment to you that I offer is that I think your staff report uh, amply supports the position that staff is recommending to you that the relief that is requested be refused. And uh, I think as well will provide a robust and defensible position for council when this matter goes to the local planning appeal tribunal. It appears to me from reading the report that neither the applicant nor its design team has made any attempt whatsoever to even try to reach a halfway point with the community and indeed with city staff such that a compromise proposal might be developed to go forward. And the last thing that I'd like to say is though I don't live in this neighborhood, I am a citizen of Ottawa, and I live in Councillor McKinney's ward, Somerset Ward 14, and I can share with you that right across from where I live currently, right across the street from where my living room window is, there is a significant rezoning application that will be coming forward within this term of council. And uh, some of the same issues that are being dealt with here, the potential effect on traffic, the potential effect on the streetscape, pedestrians, how it fits in with the surrounding neighborhood will be at play there. And I think quite frankly, that what is currently proposed in this particular situation is not appropriate, does not represent uh, good planning, and frankly uh, would set a terrible precedent, a terrible unfortunate precedent for other areas of the city where development is needed and development is going to be coming forward, such as in Somerset Ward. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming out. Thanks, Carrie. Nice to see you again. Uh, Mr. Fleming, David Fleming, are you here? And Bill Holtzman? Where are you, Bill? Not, you're next. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll be very brief. Uh, Heritage Ottawa's position hasn't changed on this uh, item in the past 16 months. Um, since we sent the letter, which is document eight of your uh, of the staff report, we heartily endorse the staff recommendation on this because we feel that the proposal ignores the central recommendations of the Byward Market Heritage Conservation District for height and massing, context, setbacks, and streetscape. Um, I won't go into any more detail on that. The other thing that we're concerned about is that the rezoning application has proceeded application under the Ontario Heritage Act. Uh, we raised this question um, uh, 16 months ago and we have never really received a, an explanation. And uh, as we're going ahead with the new official plan where there is emphasis on communities and context and communities, you know, I think uh, we, we should have some sort of explanation from staff uh, on why this, uh, why this sort of thing takes place. You know, the proper procedure for us would be to apply under the Ontario Heritage Act to have a, 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 a heritage impact statement for the, for the property. Once that is settled, then the proposal for rezoning should come forward. So that's more of a question for either now or sometime in the future. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Oh, thank. Do you have a question? Um, oh, Gower. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Why would you point? I just wanted to quickly mention I will be asking staff uh, that question once we get to our staff questions. Oh, thank you. Okay. Well, that's good. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Fleming. Uh, Bill Holtzman and Samir Gulamari. Gulamani. Uh, good morning, uh, uh, Chair, members of committee. My name is Bill Holzman. We're the uh, planning consultants for the uh, application and the applicant, and I have with me uh, a principal of the development company, Samir Guliani, who will uh, start our presentation, and then I'll follow up, and we'll be uh, quite brief, actually. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, I'm Samir Gulmani. I uh, represent Bayview Hospitality Group. Um, and uh, we, provide, we prepared some slides today, which I'll take you through briefly uh, during our time. Um, Baby Hospitality has been in business 35 years. Uh, it's founded by my father. It's a family business. Um, we've been building hotels and residential communities um, since about 2005. And uh, in all of our communities, we see ourselves as you know, part of these communities. Uh, we, we don't generally build and sell. We, build to stay there. Um, you know, we've created uh, employment. We've supported tourism in the markets that we're in. Uh, we recently completed the hotel in uh, Homewood Suites by Hilton in Kanata, uh, as well as a residential apartment building. Uh, and we're very proud of the work that we do. Um, this uh, site, uh, you know, we chose this site uh, because of its relationship to the byward market. Uh, and this is just an overview here. You know, uh, we love the Byward Market. It's a very important uh, tourism destination. Uh, we think that, you know, contributing uh, investment into the Byward Market, adding some hotel rooms will greatly improve uh, its status as a national and international tourism destination. Uh, you know, what attracted us to this site is uh, not just its relationship to the Byward Market, but also the fact that they were taller buildings around the, uh, the locale uh, where this site is. Uh, it's 500 meters from uh, the new Rideau LRT station. Um, and uh, it's beside a 19-story building. It's behind a 22-story building uh, that site plan approved. Uh, and uh, we thought that uh, what we wanted to do here was development that was sensitive to uh, the local area. Um, but that still met uh, the height that was required to make uh, the feasibility work for the site. So there's Rideau Station. <laughs> I just put up some, some heights of uh, the buildings that are nearby, uh, which uh, lend support to uh, why we think uh, our proposal is appropriate. Uh, this is just a closer view. So there's a 22-story building that's uh, site plan approved uh, right behind us uh, to the south. Uh, just immediately to the west, there's the Andaz Hotel, which is at 19 stories. Um, originally, when we submitted the plan, uh, the plan was going to be for, uh, uh, to match the height of the buildings behind us at, at, at roughly 20 stories. Uh, but after we did our community consultations and a pre-consultation with UDRP, um, you know, we didn't get, ex we didn't get uh, very specific guidance on what to do, but we decided to drop the height to 17 stories. Uh, which is where the plan uh, sits at today. Um, <coughs> we also uh, did consultations, uh, pretty broad consultations with the neighborhood, uh, with the neighbors. It's a tight site, it's 11,000 square feet. Uh, we tried to see if we could pick up uh, some more room uh, on uh, the west, uh, east, or south sides. Uh, and we were uh, ultimately unsuccessful in doing that, but uh, you know, it is still a buildable site. It's a parking lot now. It, it, you know, we think that uh, what we want to do here is contribute to this market. Um, I should just mention that you know the policy, uh, the city's policy here is that, uh, uh, or at least the Byward Market Heritage Conservation uh, District study. One of the guidelines is that uh, parking lots are actually very undesi undesirable in this area, and what should be there is uh, an active streetscape. So, um, you know, um, factoring all that in, uh, what we did was, uh, you know, we put in an active streetscape. You know, what, one interesting thing that you see in the Byward Market, what makes it a, a wonderful place to be, 
is that uh, as you walk through it every 30 feet, uh, there's something new to look at, uh, a new storefront. <clears throat> and so uh, uh, when we added that as part of our design, we stepped the tower back uh, in order to mitigate the effect on the pedestrian environment. Um, we uh, incorporated the design and materials that you see in the Byward Market. And um, <clears throat> I'll just uh, mention that we also uh, picked up the ar architectural facade of the building that's next to us, uh, which is uh, called the major building, the warehouse building, the five-story building to the east of us, um, in order to uh, give it a relationship uh, to that building, which is a recognized category two, uh, category two uh, in the in the in the study. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, with that, I'll conclude my comments uh, and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, I don't see. Did you want to say something too, Bill? Uh, yes, just to add uh, a couple minutes to Samir's uh, presentation. We were the firm that was retained 2018 to prepare the uh, land use planning rationale. Uh, along with other studies that were done, there is a CHIS, a, a Cultural Heritage Impact Statement, uh, uh, submitted with our applications as well. That came up earlier with a previous speaker. Our, our report concluded that the uh, the zoning bylaw amendment, the minor application, was appropriate for the site for a variety of reasons. As Samir said, there was an initial consultation for a larger, taller building, but our, our, our submission went in with the 17-story uh, after extensive period of reflection and uh, contemplation discussions with neighbours to see if we could address some of the uh, preliminary comments that came out of all those consultations. Uh, one of the specific issues here is, is the angular plane that uh, drives uh, the maximum building height. And although it, uh, it, it starts at six meters back from the front lot line and uh, extends uh, to the rear, which establishes a maximum height of 50 meters for the maximum height, which typically would represent the ability to build a 16-story building, the problem with an angular plane is it's very, very unfeasible because that's only at one particular point on a site. So obviously, a number of schemes were developed by the design team to look at what we could do within that angular plane. And it just became unreasonable for a variety of reasons, including how you locate the core of the building, how you have certain floor plates that operate properly, uh, and, and really the, the amount of usable space that's generated over a site, particularly this site. So at the end of the day, what came forward was, uh, and again, we, we felt that this warranted a full review through a, a bylaw amendment, not seeking to go to the Committee of Adjustment for variances. We felt that uh, it was needed a thorough review, which it's going through, and unfortunately, it's led us to the point now. Now, one of the uh, very brief points I will make is that our, our application was filed uh, it, was, uh, it was deemed complete, it was processed, and unfortunately we, we, we attempted to try to deal with staff in a, in a proactive way to present uh, various options. And uh, we, were, we felt we were making some headway, uh, and January of 2019 came along, which gave my client the right to appeal, but they had no intentions of appealing. So continuing over the next nine months or so, we continued to try to see if we can engage in a, in a, in a constructive manner to deal with their issues. It came really out of the blue where staff said, we're preparing a report to refuse in August of this past year, and we were quite surprised, actually. Uh, we were able to, uh, to uh, deal with staff and get an, you know, a delay of that. That brought us to today. Uh, but again, uh, we, we, we felt that there was some room to continue a, a constructive dialogue. Now, as Samir said, again, we were, we were uh, cognizant of and we were appreciative of the policies in place, guidelines that were uh, developed in 30 years ago for, the, uh, for the, uh, the, the district. But at the end of the day, we felt that the project on a whole uh, was supportable by the land use planning documents, which uh, Samir has, has indicated very briefly. So again, uh, we ask that you uh, do not accept staff's recommendation and that you approve this, uh, this bylaw amendment to uh, recommend approval to council. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Brockington. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, gentlemen, for your comments and, and brief presentation. Just so I'm clear, um, I heard that the initial height had been reduced um, to what it is now. Can you just remind me what the original height was, what it is now, and were there any other significant changes that you made to the original uh, proposal? Thank you for the question, Councillor. Through the chair. Um, uh, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
we uh, originally uh, had a, our plan at 20 stories. Um, and uh, we decided to revise it after the informal consultation with the UDRP. We dropped the height to 17 stories. Uh, the direction uh, by some of the panelists at the UDRP was that we should match the height of the nearby building. Uh, in order to do that, that's how we got to 17 stories. Uh, the other thing we changed uh, after the, uh, that point was uh, we, um, the, 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 yeah, the, the major building was an important, uh, important component of the planning because you know, if, you look at the, if you look at the map of the Heritage Conservation District, which here is outlined in gray, we're kind of right on the edge of that district on the east side and what's marked and that's indicated by a purple arrow that's the subject site the blue uh, the blue site uh, just to the east of that is the major building um, which is noted as a category two and it's the reason essentially that the that the heritage conservation district jogs out to try to grab that that blue building uh, that that category two building and has included our parking lot um, but uh, you know, because that is a, a resource, a, a recognized heritage resource, uh, the recommendation uh, from the UDRP was that you know make some kind of relationship to that building, uh, pick up the architectural facade, and use it as a key, um, a, a, which is what we've done there. And you can see that uh, pretty clearly in this image that I'm showing you here. Okay, my um, final question is just regarding the. Um, loading space provisions staff have raised concerns with um i'll use the word in their inadequate uh, loading space provisions can you just um expand on this what what are your thoughts on the loading space provisions why are you proposing something and we have staff raising objections thank you uh so the um you know, one of the challenges with this site, it's an 11,000 square foot site, you know, and because it's, uh, because it's tight, uh, the, you know, we had to have the parking uh, in the center of the site with the turning angles. Uh, the concern uh, from the staff report uh, is that, um, you know, it's insufficient. Now, I, I did discuss with the architect that, you know, some of that can be revised, uh, you know, with respect to turning angles, making sure that uh, trucks and cars can get out. Uh, we haven't uh, done that revision yet or, or submitted it to the city just because we were so hung up on uh, other aspects, uh, major aspects of the site, but uh, not, none of that is insurmountable. Uh, and since we're on the subject of the parking garage, I'll just talk about that uh, as well. Uh, you know, the intention here is not to have a dark garage. Um, that, uh, that garage represents an opportunity to uh, have some public art, uh, have a light wall, um, you know, have uh, something that contributes uh, again to this uh, to this beautiful market. Patron drop off. Patron drop off. Inside. Oh yes. Uh, <laughs> Bills are reminding me to talk about the patron drop off. The, so the so the the guests of the hotel, uh, you know the, the you know taxis and uh, the pickup and drop off for the site uh, that would actually happen inside that garage. So the lobby entrance is inside there, um, and uh, we're going to make sure that the turning angles uh, are appropriate uh, to make sure that that's easy to do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. I don't have any other. Uh, I just have a question just for my own, uh, just wanting to put it out there. I forget what the recommendation was on the ANDES when that came forward. Is there, there, you two can go back into the audience, please. Um, yeah. So the Andes is not hasn't been built that long though is my point. And they have referenced it as a you know a, did we we didn't refuse like you did not refuse that you recommended that, correct? Um, Madam Chair, that's correct. The staff recommendation on the Andes is there today was approval. Yeah. Okay, so here's my so in the executive summary, the second paragraph um, says the proposal does not align with the planning and heritage policies applicable to high-rise development at this specific location in the lower town neighborhood within the byward market heritage conservation district the property is designated central area da 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 da, -da, -da. Um, my question is this is literally next door same height pretty much I think nicer, but just my personal opinion, I like the detail they put on the bottom. What causes you specifically? Is it a change in policy? 
I think probably our high rise policy maybe. It's the change in policy that has changed it. What, what else? I, I just speak to me on this because, you know, to, to hold them one against the other, I need, I, need a, I, need a, I need the facts on what triggered you to make that decision. Um, yes, Madam Chair. Um, as members of the committee may know, um, recently, and it has been done through zoning, but we have our high-rise guidelines that uh, talks about um, separation distances uh, between buildings, between high-rise buildings, so everything over uh, 10 stories in height. Um, with uh, preferably 23 meters, it can be augmented down somewhat uh, depending on circumstances. Uh, but we're looking for uh, tower separations, which in this case, uh, the lot is very small. Uh, the building is constructed lot line to lot line, all four lot lines, uh, as well within, um, if you're going to have a high-rise building, you should have a, a minimum size. Um, I think it might be about 1,800 uh, square meters. This is just over 1,000, like the, the lot size uh, doesn't meet that requirement. Uh, there are, are policies for transition um, to uh, other properties, and it's a building that goes straight up. There is a little bit of a uh, setback in the front, but uh, again, the, um, the zoning that's on there now that calls for that angular plane is to have a lot more transition uh, than exists today. Um, there was concern as well, when you talk about the ground floor, it's, you can see it there. Uh, while they do have a little bit of area on the ground floor that uh, is animated, uh, most of it is a parking garage. No matter how well it's lit, it's still a parking garage. Uh, there's no animation there. And on the right side, there are some utility doors. So um, I, if you want, um, Leslie uh, Collins here to, can speak to the heritage uh, component of this, because this is within the Heritage Conservation District. Um, but from a um, policy that you mentioned, Madam Chair, those are some of the changes that have taken place. So it's a moment in time, and it's where we are in time that has, has uh, taken you in the direction that you went on. And, and that's... That's fine. I'm not, I'm not trying to find fault with you. I just think it's a legitimate question to ask when they are basically side by side. Okay? Thank you. All right. Okay, well, thank you very much. I don't see any other questions. And on this item, which is the Zoning Bylaw Amendment for 116 York Street, um, you want yeas and nays or is carried? Carried. Carried? Okay. So opposed by Councillor Brockington. All right. Thank you very much. Um, now we're going on to our last two items, which I'm going to tie together. They're the same street. Um, and that street or avenue is Robinson Avenue. And we have... Um, the Zoning Bylaw Amendment and Site Plan Control for 1929 and 134 Robinson Avenue. And we have the Zoning Bylaw Amendment and Site Plan Control for 36 Robinson Avenue. Um, let's see, who do we have for speakers? Hang on a second. So on both of them, I have the developer who is registered along with um, Scott McAnch. Scott, did I kill your name or come on up? Come on forward, please. You're here on behalf of Wendy Duchesne and David Eldon. And thank you very much for giving us all of that information ahead of time. It's really good to be able to you know, read it ahead of time. So this is as I said, the zoning bylaw amendments and site plan controls for 1929 and 134 Robinson, and as well the zoning bylaw and site plan control for 36 Robinson. So, sir, the time, your time, I'm going to let you go over five minutes if you need because you're okay. talking to two. Yeah, I appreciate that because there are slightly different concerns with 36 than the other three. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to speak today, and thank you for indicating that you received my written submissions in advance. I don't intend to repeat those uh, you know, substantially. I'll always be covering some of the same points today, but um, I, I want to say at the outset that my submissions are limited to the zoning uh, recommendations. I don't intend to speak to the site plan aspects of it okay. at all. 
Um, as staff indicates in the report, the main thing that's being sought here is a reduction in the minimum parking requirements for uh, all four of the projects. And the reductions sought are quite significant. On the smaller towers, it's from a minimum of 17 down to effectively two with the car share lot there. Uh, and on the larger tower, it's uh, you know nearly half of what was initially required. Um, those are significant changes, and I think that it's important to you know, go over the policy rationale for minimum parking requirements and the recency with which this committee uh, and council have considered minimum parkings in this specific area. So as I'm sure the committee is aware, Robinson Village is a relatively small neighborhood at the bottom of a hill, sort of bounded by Lees Avenue and the river and the highway. It's currently a fairly low rise neighborhood. Uh, it is zoned R5 primarily, so it, it's certainly intended to have some increase in intensity. But it is, by the geography, fairly isolated from the rest of Sandy Hill, from major services. Um, Google tells me it's a minimum 24 minutes walk to the closest grocery store, for instance. It's a fairly isolated little neighborhood. Um, and I think for that reason, when the minimum parking standards review took place in 2016, it was explicitly excluded from the Area Z uh, sort of waiver of parking minimums. Uh, it, it's in the inner urban area, which has you know, a, a baseline 0.5 per unit uh, set in Section 101 of the bylaw. And that's what the applicant and the city, with the city's support, is seeking to waive today. The city effectively says that it should have been included in Z or that the intention when that plan was looked at was that other sites could be brought into that fold. But I think that ignores the larger context in which the, not only the parking minimums, but the whole intensity of development in the area came to be. I think it's important to recall that when the transit-oriented development plans were being looked at for Lees, Robinson Village was actually downzoned. Uh, well, the lands closer to Lee's stations were significantly upzoned. And that resulted in an appeal by the owner, the then owner of 36 to the then OMB, uh, which I understand from a letter that's been provided to me by my clients, was settled with the city uh, to leave that site at a slightly higher density of eight stories, which was put into the secondary plan while the rest of the lot was set at its R5 designation, effectively six stories. So the parking, I think, consideration ties in with that view that Robinson Village is special, that it's a lower density zone in a transit-oriented development plan that was looking at increasing density and mixing use near transit stations. This little corner was viewed as different enough that it was down-zoned uh, and it's residential, it's not considered mixed use. So it's, although it is a relatively short walk to Lee Station, it is a specially unique community, and I think previous decisions of this body and council show that there's an understanding that that is the case. So I think to come here uh, and effectively say that this should have been in the area that requires a, you know, effectively considers parking as not necessary, uh, doesn't reflect the history of the process or the reality in Robinson Village. Being so isolated and removed from services means that people who move there are likely to come with a car. Uh, the walk to Lees Station is indirect. It costs, requires crossing the Lees Bridge over the highway, which can be windy at times. There's a graded path to get up there. So it's not a long walk, but it's a walk that many people will not want to take. And so more than two people out of 46 units are likely to come with cars. And the effect of removing the minimum is to externalize on the community the pressures created by that car ownership. Because those cars will have to be parked somewhere. And I know the site plan has a requirement that people find legal parking, but that is a pressure that then is dumped on the community and removed from the site owner to provide that to the people purchasing its property. I don't think that's a policy direction that this committee wants to go. And I think the drastic reductions in parking here, therefore, are not appropriate for these sites. Now, specifically on the 36 Robinson site, uh, it is my opinion that it does not comply with the designation in the secondary plan. The Sandy Hill Secondary Plan set a density cap of eight stories, and that's quite clearly set out in Schedule L. 
um, which I'm, counselors are free to look at uh, at their leisure, but it quite clearly states that the density cap is a maximum of eight stories with no density minimum. The application here is proposing a nine story building on that site. Now staff say that that still complies with the site specific zoning, which is set at 27 meters, and that may be true, but if council knowingly approves a project that blatantly breaches the density cap set in the secondary plan, I would say that there's, that's legally questionable uh, and possibly illegal. That we have a strict cap set in the secondary plan of eight stories and we have a project telling you that they're going to put nine there. That is a higher density than specifically specified in the secondary plan. And I believe on that basis, 36 uh, should not be approved. The parking concerns apply to all four sites. That is a specific concern with 36 Robinson. So those are my submissions. Um, there's some other uh, concerns raised in the letters I sent to the councillors, and I trust that you've read those and will consider those as well in your decision making. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Great. Uh, thank you for that, Scott. Uh, Councillor Lieber. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I'm struggling with this file. Uh, ordinarily, I am a champion for reducing parking requirements. Uh, I recognize the transportation challenges in Robinson Village, however. Uh, that is not a particularly friendly pedestrian environment to get to transit unless one walks north uh, to the University of Ottawa. And, and groceries are going to be challenging as well. It looks like a bit of a, uh, well, it is a food desert uh, in that immediate neighborhood. But you've asserted that uh, people will move their with cars. I, I don't necessarily agree. I'm wondering if you can unpack that for me. I, I forget the total number of units and the, the full development, um, but surely there are a few hundred people who don't have cars who would give their eye teeth to get uh, an affordable rental uh, in, in this kind of proximity to downtown. Yeah. Can sure. you hear me? Yes. Don't okay. touch it. Perfect. Uh, thank you for the question. I, I, if I stated that people would all move there with cars, that uh, was not my intention. I, I think what the bylaw minimum of the parking plan envisions that more than a few people will want a car if they move there. Certainly there will be people who view it as you know accessible enough or want to live a car-free lifestyle or the price point will strike them as correct. Like People will move there without cars. I think that's safe to say. What I think the parking minimum, and it's of course a policy discretionary decision, but it's the idea that a certain number of people will move there with cars and that the, the cost and the effort of storing those cars is properly borne by the party developing the site and not just dumped on the community at large. I, I still struggle because I, I think, uh, as, I, as I chatted with the developer yesterday about this, I come across this in, in Hintonburg and Westboro all the time where developers are building buildings that don't have parking and, and I've been supporting uh, those buildings. Uh, but you can put it in the site plan as a condition that they are going to be very explicit with potential tenants. There is no parking. Uh, when there's no parking for a building and people move in and they ignore the landlord's warning, they bring a car, they're trying to park on the street. They are calling my office within a few months looking for help to try to find parking because they're being ticketed. Um, they're, they're finding the inconvenience of having to move for overnight snow removal is, uh, is, is too overwhelming. And, and oftentimes they simply move. It, it'll be, I, I will look forward to continuing to hear the rest of the delegations on that. But this, um, uh, it, it looks to me like this is an area where there might be at least a fair number of people who are who are going to be willing to move in without cars. I don't think we can take it for granted that they will have them, that even any will have them. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Yes, and sorry I had to leave for a minute, but um, as you know, in the um, in the report, like in the bylaw, uh, Mr. James, we were talking about this yesterday. We were meeting with uh, Councillor Flurry and uh, Mr. McCrate and uh, specific to the notification, I'm not sure legally whether that any holds, holds any water for us putting in there that there will, parking will not be available. What, what I've, I know I asked, I think you, Mr. Mark, what, did I ask you about that? Okay, but we did talk about it, right? Uh, <laughs> about the fact that we are having it in the bio, yes, you, Doug. 
Uh, yes, Madam Chair, we did chat uh, about that. Within the um, site plan um, approval, one of the conditions is that uh, it's under parking. It uh, be noted, uh, it registered on title through the site plan, but also in the leasee agreements that parking may not be available or there is no parking on site. Uh, there is limited parking in each of the smaller buildings. Um, as well, if you look at the zoning uh, for those smaller buildings and the larger building, and the larger building does have more parking. Uh, it has about 50, a little over 50 spaces, 53 I believe. But if all those spaces are not up taken by people who, who move in, they don't have cars, as opposed to staying vacant, um, people from, if they have a car or might have a private vehicle, we say, um, and the three others in the smaller buildings, they have the opportunity to park at that larger one too. So we're uh, allowing the opportunity to, to park off-site but within real close proximity. Uh, as well, I should note that uh, through the rezoning, there is a requirement for a car sharing, uh, one of the sites on there, uh, through a car sharing company. So that that people who move in and do not have a vehicle but may need it, um, they can get in and go to the grocery store. And of course, there's always alternatives by taking the transit, which is, I say, eight minutes away. It's an eight minute walk. Uh, we're having 15 minute neighborhoods try to. This is an eight minute neighborhood. Um, and of course, you can also use other um, car um, disposal services such as um, uh, car, like through Uber or something like that. Yeah, so I guess, uh, Councillor Fleury, if I was because we've had conversations about this, obviously. You know, it's a, using the 15-minute neighborhood um, concept, uh, and it's one that we're striving for through the new official plan, and we're going to be doing some extra work with the uh, uh, Federation of Community Associations and Mr. Miglas and, and, and uh, uh, Geraldine Wildman and, and different people. Um, yes, we are in that proximity, that eight-minute neighborhood to the to very very um, large node of uh, transit and walkable certainly but not to amenities not to things like a grocery store and, and, and that sort of thing so in your I don't know if you maybe this is more of a Don Herwire kind of question but um, from economic development perspective you know in this area uh, this kind of a, a build would it um, would it encourage more commercial local amenities like we're seeing in, in uh, some of the other larger neighborhoods? And is there ability for in the area for that kind of service to be built should that opportunity come up? And as part of the, I know this isn't under your bailiwick, it is more of a Don Herwire as, as the director, but uh, is that something through the official plan, our new official plan that we're looking at, just like we did the neighborhood review? Remember we did that uh, um, in your area, Councillor Leeper, specifically, we were specific on, uh, exactly. Okay, so how, I mean, if this proposal goes ahead, how does it, how does it, um, um, how do we look to accommodate some amenities in that in a walkable area? Thank you, Madam Chair. If Don wishes, he can add on to what I'm going to say. But um, of course, what we do through planning is we create the situations, we create the policy direction. Now, those 15-minute neighborhoods aren't all just snap and they're there. They're developed over time. They're to be developed over time. Uh, and what we've done here around this area is we've created a TOD, an area of um, high-density development. And of course, you have the opportunity for greater development. You have the greater number of people moving in, the greater number of people, and then those amenities uh, will follow. It's just part of the economic economic uh, situation uh, that we have within this country. Um, so you create the situ situation and if more people come in, of course, then you have the captive audience um, to have the commercial that will, will come with it. What we have now in the meantime, of course, is as I mentioned, other ways, if you have to travel a little further and you don't have a vehicle, you still have other opportunities to, uh, other than a private vehicle to go to those amenities. But what we do is, uh, as I mentioned, was we create that situation, we create the synergy uh, through the zoning. and if. By allowing more people, it just takes one more step to getting those amenities that you would find in the area. Okay, thank you. Um, I just, okay, so thank you very much, sir, for coming out. Um, Councillor Leeper has motions. I do have the, I'm going to call up the um, applicant now. I didn't even know you'd left, Kirsten. But I see you sitting on the other side. 
Kirsten and Brian Casar Grande, Roberto Campos. Is Roberto speaking too? No? Yes, okay. Okay, so while they're getting ready, can we have the motions looked on, on the, we have a new motion. We have, we're, we're losing one. Sure, we're Chair, I'll, one. I'll ask you, uh, Councillor Fleury, on whose behalf I'm making these motions to introduce them. Okay, Mr. Fleury, you want to do that right now, please? So we're all... But there's one now that's not the same, right? There's well, the new one that it, it removes the other one on site plan? Correct. I, I, I'd like to speak to that matter later sure. if, you, if you're okay well, with it. Well, actually, I think that we better, like, it's always better to get, well, we have the applicant before us. Um, well, and I would like to have that information too, because I'm kind of getting, can, you would too? Yeah, we'd like yeah. to hear it. Okay, so I'll present the first one, which is not site plan related. Um, whereas report ACS 2020 PI PS 0001, zoning bylaw amendment and site plan control 12, uh, 1929 and 134 Avenue seeks to reduce the amount of required parking, residential parking uh, from 51 spaces combined to nine, uh, 17 parking spots per building uh, down to three, and whereas 17 spots per address is required, and whereas the applicant is only providing three visitor spots per address, and whereas the zoning bylaw establishes a minimum parking requirement of 0.5 spaces per dwelling units after the first 12 units, and whereas Robinson Village has a lack of amenities and the distance to the Lee's O train station is difficult to access, resulting in the need for some residents in the building to require to, who may require a vehicle, whereas Robinson Avenue has a lack of available on-street parking, which is currently overused by existing residents, therefore be resolved that the recommended parking reduction be refused and that parking be provided in accordance with the current zoning bylaw requirements by deleting the following provisions in document 2, 4, and 6. Despite section 101, the minimum number of parking spaces required for the first 46 dwelling units is three spaces, and be it further resolved that pursuant to, to the Planning Act subsection 3417, no further, no further notice be given. So I'll speak to the matter after the, uh, so that the delegation is done. That's on the, the zoning part of Correct. it. Correct. And then I, I so had. And you've been, I, I just introduced the site plan part of it because. I can certainly attest to the fact that you have been working hard on the site plan issues. Certainly, uh, Mr. McCrate, Mr. James have been working hard on those with you, and now you've come up with something that I think is quite significant that has an agreement of the applicant. So yes, why, why so don't I don't that? have the, the, that actual motion. I, I have it in pr principle, so I don't know if you've gotten a, a clerk's uh, revised. No, that's the parking one. Do you have it, Melody? Why don't you read it while she's looking for it? I, I don't have it. Uh, oh, you don't have it either? No, I, I, that, it was something that was being worked through uh, with legal and uh, clerk staff, so I don't have a copy. Okay, well, Mr. Mark just is making a move there, so and he's running now. He's as fast as running as I've ever seen you. I know he's in good shape. He's, a, he's an awesome transit user. Mr. Mark, help us. Madam Chair, the, the, uh, the next motion uh, is a mo motion to allow further discussion to take place with respect to the site plan. Uh, and what it effectively does is rather than committee exercising its delegated authority over the site plans uh, for the properties other than 36 Robinson, it would have this committee recommending the site plans for approval to Council at its meeting on the 29th. So next week. Yes, the Chair. So it gives a little bit more time to you, but there's also, yeah. So that's going to be the motion. And Councillor Leeper's going to move it. Okay. So were you aware of that? Yes, Hello, Madam Chair. Um, Brian Casagrande. 
Kirsten Nietzsche and Roberto Campos on behalf of the applicant. We, we are aware of the nature of the motion, I guess, to, to um, allow us to, to do some, some adjustments, I guess, to the plans moving forward before council. They relate specifically, as I understand it, to rooftop amenity area. Uh, and I can give more detail to our understanding on that uh, when we go through our presentation. Perfect. Okay, go ahead. So, Madam Chair, just to be clear on a couple of things, uh, given that there's the two items and different architects for both files, Roberto's here on what we call the three smaller buildings, the six-story buildings, uh, and Barry Hoban and his team are here for the 36 um, Robinson, which is the nine-story building. So hopefully we have a collective five minutes for each. And Kirsten is going to go through uh, our presentation, and then uh, Roberto and I will add where we feel is uh, needed. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. So we have just a few slides to briefly uh, discuss the main points about the proposed development. Um, so as discussed today, the key points we wanted to make is that Robinson Village is within 600 meters of Lee's Transit Station. The official plan calls for intensification within you know, 600 meters and recognizes that through you know, increased density, uh, looking at reduced parking, requirements and even so far as uh, has been noted uh, eliminating parking requirements um, within a lot of areas of transit stations and that's the main point we're here today to talk about is that reduction in parking and how it's appropriate so and we, looking at the slides and looking at Google and you know our, our project team members have walked the sites as well um, the sites are within the 600 meters and you know five to ten minutes depending on how fast you walk um, of Lee's transit station and as you can see here, uh, just by the, the Google map. And I think also this slide really, I guess, clarifies exactly where Robinson Village and our sites are within proximity to Lee Station. Um, as you can see, Robinson Village has been left out of Area Z, um, but we do feel it is appropriate to reduce those parking requirements. Um, and as noted too, they've proposed car sharing spaces, uh, which I'll, opens up the availability for, I guess, more than one resident to make use of a parking space and will actually be available to all Robinson Village uh, residents. So uh, also, I guess, speaking besides parking, um, just looking, I guess, at the plan built context, uh, there's been some discussion about height and density and uh, within this section. So you can see here. So. The sites on the south side of Robinson, Robinson Avenue, directly across from our sites, are planned for higher density in acknowledgement of that transit, uh, that transit radius and proximity to Lee's station. All the proposed developments are within their permitted height under the zoning. Um, the nine stories are permitted under the zoning uh, within the 27 meters. So you can also just looking ahead, so this is from the uh, Ottawa U campus master plan. You can really see that this area does plan to intensify. It is evolving over time. And, and we are you know, aiding in this involvement and increasing density. And as I, I think Doug said too, you know, with respect to uh, grocery stores and amenities, you know, that synergy will come, that market will dictate what happens in the future. And we're providing that density to support those future amenities. Um, and so uh, I guess also too, um, as part of these, this future development uh, with you know, uh, the campus and the lands to the south, there are those opportunities to approve connections from the site to Lee's, um, but that remains to be seen, of course, but those opportunities are there. So in, in closing, I think we just want to reiterate that this is an appropriate development. We're within our, you know, den within our maximum height permissions. Really, we're just looking at parking today um, and acknowledging that these sites are within uh, close proximity to Lee's, uh, Lee's station. Madam Chair, I'll just add a couple of quick things. Uh, this committee will, will likely remember that FOTEN, myself uh, specifically on some of the files, has been before this panel several times. Uh, Councillor Leeper's ward has a, a number of active files really uh, closely approximated to the rapid transit station. The walking distance on those files is no different than, than the walking distance that we're dealing with here. And although Robinson Village uh, you know, would like to convey themselves as being uh, 
isolated from Lee's station. I don't see it any differently than those files. And in those files, we've sought and received support from council for reducing and eliminating, in some cases, the required parking. So in my view, this is no different. Um, and I think it's an appropriate um, uh, initiative to be putting forward. Uh, with respect to the concern over food desert, aside from the fact that I think increasing density will improve demand, I can tell you that Foten's consulted with developers already who are interested in building a food store in proximity to, these, to this neighborhood. So in time, uh, that will change. And right now, it's, it's simply two subway stops away, or LRT stops away. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah. Councillor Fleury. Yes, Madam President. I uh, wanted to uh, follow up on two things that, uh, one, one which was raised to me the last 24 hours, but one that was raised earlier as it relates to, so I, I will speak to the issue of parking reduction that you're asking for uh, at my time, but I have a question for you as it relates to your proposal for the car sharing component. How would, if this goes through today, how would the applicant uh, ensure the sustainability of the car sharing and, um, and confirm that it is in place? How does that work in your world? So the, the site plan has a condition that's obligating my client to provide the car sharing, a car sharing space, if you will, on the three um, low rise, not mid rise sites. Um, we have a commitment letter from, uh, in this case, I believe it's Virtue Car, but it you know, could ultimately be any other car sharing service. Um, and so the obligation eternally, as long as the site plan condition doesn't change, is that, that that'll have to be provided. So it's going to be on the surface, it's going to be in the rear yard of each of those buildings. And the way car sharing works, in my understanding from those that I work with that use it regularly, is you have, uh, you're basically you're a member, you then look to book the car in advance, and the, the service simply says, well, where are, the, where are your options for that day and time that you're interested in? So this would be available certainly and convenient for the residents of those buildings, but it's available to anybody else in the neighborhood that also has an interest in that service. And, and what if the agreement with specifically you use the virtue car, but what if it doesn't, it falls through, what happens then? Then I believe they're, they're going to have an issue in terms of having to come back before uh, staff and ultimately you to revise the site plan condition and may trigger a revision to the site plan application. I'm not sure how the city would process that, but we'd simply have to demonstrate that there's been every effort to try and bring them on board and that I assume it's just purely market demand because at the end of the day, this is a business. The business is there to serve a demand. If the demand is there, they're going to provide. If the demand isn't, then they won't. So I would hope that if the demand's not there, then all involved would realize that these buildings are actually functioning fine without that provision. Okay. My second question relates to... Um you, you had a uh, you had uh, lobbying representation over the number of weeks, and uh, as part of the lobbying exercise, there's a conversation from the applicant. I don't know uh, who specifically about some capacity to build an elevator from the Grade of Robinson to the overpass of the 417. Is that can you e extrapolate what the uh, the lobbying efforts were on that specifically? I think I'm what interested. you're recalling or what you might have heard, Councillor, is um, you know, FOTEN is often asked to go along with the, the person that's speaking to members of the planning committee to answer planning related questions. And so one of the things that um, if we had more time would have been part of Kirsten's presentation because we had discussed it in advance was there's a whole evolution in time. Like these, these projects are coming forward. They're introducing density that we feel is appropriate. And I think there's an evolution and an opportunity over time for certain things to be improved for this community. So one of them I just mentioned about the opportunity for another food store. But specifically, we were asked to do what I call a mini master plan for this community as part of our planning rationale, really to look at opportunities and constraints in the community so that the community and yourself
health counselor and staff might have a bit of an idea of things to look for as the community intensifies over time. So um, one of the ideas that we introduced in that in that exercise was recognizing that, Kirsten, if you can back up in the slide, one more, right there. So you can see that there's a stub of, I guess that's Robinson Avenue, but I can't read, that goes into where the um, parking lot is for the park. Herdman so it's, Road. okay, Herdman Road. So what we said is, that doesn't necessarily have to be a fully wide municipal right of way. It could be reduced to a single lane road to provide access to that park or to the parking lot. And that would actually introduce an opportunity for the city to partner, in my view, with the lands that are immediately adjacent to it to actually introduce a, a larger building. In my view, that would be an appropriate location for a high rise to be considered only because it's so close to the transit station and its impacts in terms of shadowing fall on the park. But regardless of what the building might look like, you could actually then incorporate something within the building that would be escalators or an elevator or something that would provide an even more direct connection up to Lees Avenue that would address any accessibility concerns over the long term. This is pie in the sky and it would certainly involve you being a champion to that counselor, but it's one idea that we came up with. Okay, but just to clarify, it's an idea and you're not proposing to pay for it? No, not through this okay. development. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. No more questions for you? Oh, well, you're not on the list, so I know. I'm, I'm not making it up, Councillor Leeper. <coughs> now you are. Thank you. Thanks, and if um, you could just advance the two slides again to the, uh, the greater, and forgive me, I was, I was conferring with the chair on something that I'm sure was extremely important, but what is the timeline to start seeing that density here? Because this, this neighborhood will be significantly more livable when that density comes and when the density comes with the amenities. But is that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now? I mean, that's incredibly difficult to predict, Councillor, but I, at the end of the day, most of those yellow lar uh, buildings, the largest ones, are on the city's maintenance yards. So I get the, at the end of the day, the city would have to agree that they're actually going to close those yards and, and either jointly develop or sell the lands for development. The ones that are not on those lands is just purely a question of whether the landowners have an interest in redevelopment and you know what is this, the life cycle realities of their existing buildings and I, I, I can't predict that. No, and it's, it's an ideal place to get uh, some, some mixed use affordable housing. Uh, I, I hope council is shortly going to approve a, a housing emergency uh, motion. Uh, so I hope we can accelerate that, but it still is 10, 15 years away probably. Okay, thanks. On that, Councillor Fleury just has... Uh... Uh, I, I, hate, I recognize Ryan's role, but for my colleague's question and for everyone's purpose, what is the dense yellow section is the city's Herdman Yards. If you want sidewalks to be plowed downtown, if you want operations, all your winter ops for downtown streets come out of that lot. And Kevin's team, Kevin Wiley in Public Works, has confirmed the importance of that access. So for the record, it is a city-owned Public Works yard that has important use. Question is it zoned anything like is there dual zoning on it? Like in former municipalities like for example Nepean, we had dual zoning. Like on the snow, strand herd snow dump, we have dual zoning. Recognizing that in X number of years it's going to not be a snow dump and that very valuable land and that in the case of that would be prestige business park. So is there that on it or is it absolutely uh, up for the works yard? Uh, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm not 100% uh, sure if the zoning on the storage yards itself has an exception which permits that continued Maybe you operation. Just find out between the but the surround, all the surrounding lands definitely do have transit oriented development zoning, okay. including the lands on the other side of, of Lees and Robinson. I don't know if Brian, if they're controlling it, want to show the aerial. But the okay. storage yard lands are not the only ones in question with potential of bringing that mixed use development. All right, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Thank you, Madam Chair. Should I stay for the next item or?
Is there's 36. This was the this was the two of them all of it? together. <laughs> okay. Did you have any questions for Barry's team because they didn't? Uh, Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Hoban's team? There you are. Hi, Barry. No, we don't. But thank you, thank you for coming out. Um, okay, so we have. Do you want to do wrap up? You do wrap up, and then we have the motions being moved by Councillor Leeper. I guess, are there any questions to staff prior to me speaking from other members of? Well, okay. I think that they did. But okay. Um, I, see none, I see none, so you go ahead. So, Madam Chair, I, I will ask for your diligence. I, uh, there, because we're tying two reports, I did prepare a short video. It's a walk from the closest site to the LRT that I will ask Matt in a few seconds to introduce. Uh, I'll ask for your diligence because I, I might need six minutes, if you will, instead of five, because the video is four minutes. So um, just to maybe set the context, and the only matter I want to speak to is the history around the TOD for this site. So I recognize this is the planning approvals team, but previous to that, there was a, a city planning policy team that was working on the transit TOD for lease. That was Don Morris and Chris Bauer. Browser. I, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce his last name properly. Um, at the time when they approached us, Robinson was not included in the site, but they recognized the risk if they didn't include uh, that arguments were going to be made at it, as its proximity to the lease station. So um, they included it in the zone and wanted to put height caps to it. At the time, uh, this, uh, Tim Mark had advised that team that, hey, this is an exercise of upzoning, so you can't just cap to the height that you have today in zoning. So the exercise gone through, we were in front of planning committee and council, I believe Mr. Mark, in 2013 for a bylaw approval in 2014, something in that range. At that time, um, we were uh, of the mind that we needed to identify a cap and protect that unique one street community that is isolated by the 417, by, um, by the river, uh, and by, uh, by the, the height of the, uh, the, overpa the, um, the overpass of the 417, or the connection to the 417, the Lees Avenue overpass. So um, we embarked in that journey and we were appealed, which then that was settled on, and that's the nine story, so that's the 36 Robinson. And really that, that unfortunately, uh, that component as sort of sailed. But one thing out of that exercise remains is that the city planning policy team at the time who reviewed the TOD kept the parking requirements. It did, they did not remove the parking requirements as part of the TOD exercise because they recognized all of the issues that were raised by, uh, by the community's lawyer. And I, I want to thank the community. You're seeing about 10 members in the community there are about 50 of them, and instead of individually speaking, they hired a lawyer to speak on their behalf, which made it a lot clearer for everyone and, and saved a lot of time uh, in today's delegation. So I want to thank, uh, thank that effort. What I, what I want to show to you is the importance of keeping the parking requirement. And that's all I'm asking today. Not asking you to play on the zoning side. The only thing I'm asking is what the exercise that we'd gone through to the Lee's TOD had parking requirements, I'm asking you to keep that. So I would like Matt to throw the video so that I can show you the complexity of walking to the LRT station from what is the closest site out of today's app, the four applicants. Oh. On Robinson Avenue, uh, you can see that it's uh, one street. This is one of the uh, properties that's up for re redevelopment from TC United. That's in front of you, uh, planning committee today. And then you can see further down the other white uh, sign from planning. Uh, on the right side is where uh, the nine story was proposed further up. And then uh, on the other side of the street, right around the corner, basically in the back of these properties, So here we are. I'm uh, going to walk this side along. Basically, it's close to the same level just to show you how. 
So Madam Chair, what I'll do, I, there's a technical glitch on the video. I'll share it, I'll share it with all committee members. Um, so I, but for the purpose of you're voting on a motion, so I want to give you the context. Yeah, but you also are giving the, you know, the, the site plan, well, the issues that we have in the motion here are going to come to the council. Well, you're voting on the motion. There's two separate. You're talking about the parking one. Yeah, I'm talking about on the today. parking one only, really. Okay. Yeah. You're not talking about the other one anymore. No, no. Okay. Um, so, I so I will send every member the video so that you get to see the details. But I walked from the closest station of Lee, uh, 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 close. So from the closest building to the Lee's uh, LRT, it took me eight minutes. So when you look at it, you say, okay, it's just eight minutes. But it is a narrow strip of sidewalk that we all have in a, this is a one in, one out. There's not, it's not a grid community. It's one street, one out. In the summer, it's super great. You're near the, uh, the Rideau River, so there's a multi-use pathway. It's great connection along, uh, along there. Um, and in the summer, sure, it's, it's very walkable. But any time but that, especially uh, when it's dark, when it's cold, it gets very complicated. And I want to share with you the grade difference. So Robinson is lower than the four. It's at the same height as the 417. Yet Sandy Hill is much higher, about, and I'm not an engineer, but let's say 10 meters higher. So you have to start at the, at the Robinson level, walk up this ramp that follows the uh, Lee's overpass. That is, it's quite steep, as residents would confirm. It, it, it's often, uh, well, it's not properly lit. It's, it often takes time for, uh, for the plow to get there. Then you get to uh, near Chapel and Lees and you walk over the 417. Uh, we don't have many of those, um, but it is, what I can say is that it is an, a very long, windy, cold walk, even on the coldest days. So you're walking all over top and then the yeah. Oh, okay, those are some, some of the images. Um, so, so what's important for me to share with you is that you have, you're assuming that, so there's a reason why we, we're asking for some parking amenities. And that's why it was thought through as the LRT. You're far from any food source. So, okay, great, you take the LRT, but then you have baggages, and you're not just walking at the street level, and even if it was a it, it could, you could have easier 15 minute walks than you have an eight minute walk to this location. And that's what I want to express to you is that you're very far from amenities. You're lower than the street level. You have to walk above the 417. Um, so, you know, we can't, today you, you do not have those amenities. And I want to reaffirm that we had gone through the TOD exercises and the planning policy staff had kept the parking for this exact reason. It is a ratio, so I'm not talking about 36, but out of the other buildings, you have around 150 units. What would be provided here is nine parking. That, that to me is unrealistic. Uh, we have students in uh, the neighborhood and they've had to get cars. It's gotten so complicated. We have uh, homeowners, they all have cars. And they're all walkers and they all use transit, but at a given time, you need to get to the doctors. If, the LRT, if it's not on the LRT line, it might not be doable. You might have to go to the Costco. You might have to go to the arena with your kids. So depending on the variety of demographics for that area, it is simply, you're just not as connected as it looks on a map. You have to live it. And I know that some members of the committee had a chance to go and see uh, the, pro the complexities of the site. Uh, for those of you who had not, I will share with you the video. I'm sorry for uh, today's technical glitch. And I would encourage you, uh, the only thing I'm asking for you is just to uphold the parking requirements uh, for that zone. That's, and that's the motion that's in front of you. Moved by Councillor Leeper. Yeas and nays? It's on the uh, screen. Okay, Councillor Dudas? No, so this is, so the motion, at the therefore be it resolved. Let me just get down to the bottom there. Never mind. Okay, therefore be it resolved that the recommended parking reductions are refused. 
and that parking be provided in accordance with the current zoning bylaw by deleting the following provision. Okay, so so on the um, Councillor Flurry through Councillor Leeper's motion, Councillor Dudas. Councillor Dudas. Okay. Here we go. No. Councillor Gower. No. Just start talking louder. I'm not. I'm not at you yet. Um, do I really have to say his name, uh, Councillor Shirelli? No, Councillor Leeper. No. Councillor Brockington. Yes. Councillor Blay. Uh, no. Councillor Moffat. No. Councillor Hubley. No. My chair, tyranny, myself. No. One, two, three, four, five, six to one. Is that what you have? Seven to one. Seven to one. I must be not counting myself. Okay. Oh, I see. Leaper. All right. And on the on the on the next one, which is going up on the screen, is it there? Yep. Therefore, be resolved that recommendation three be amended by it to commence. The planning committee recommend that council approve. Yeah, that's the site plan one. Carried? Thank you. On the item as amended? Carried? Thank you. All right. And then you have to do uh, the next one as well, seven, just to say on the report recommendation. On um, what numbers? And so on, that was on number six, and so number seven on the report. Number seven, which is 36 Robinson, the carry? Carried? Thank you. Okay. All right. Oh, I didn't do this one earlier. You don't need to do anything with it. No, but I didn't ask them if they wanted to lift it. No the motion? I never said your name. Vice Chair Al Shantiri was here too. I mean the chair of the other committee. Sorry about that, Eli. Um, adjournment? Okay, our next meeting is February the thirteenth. Can I ask you to get somebody to